I call this meeting to order. This is the December 8th, 2021 regular meeting of the Shirts Planning and Zoning Commission. Item number two on the agenda is to seat an alternate and uh, we, we have none present this evening. Item number three is a hearing of residents. Wasn't expecting the crowd tonight. Thank you all for being here. Oh, we're gonna have this issue again. Um, I can eat the microphone. Can you hear me? Is this better? How about now? Yeah, okay. I thought they had fixed this. See, there's a little sweet spot right here somewhere. Okay. So this time is set aside for any person who wishes to address the Planning and Zoning Commission. Each person should fill out the speaker's register prior to the meeting. Presentation should be limited to no more than three minutes. Discussion by the commission of any item not on the agenda shall be limited to statements of specific factual information given in response to any inquiry, a recitation of existing policy in response to an inquiry, and or a proposal to place the item on a future agenda. The presiding officer during the hearing of residents portion of the agenda will call on those persons who have signed up to speak in the order they have registered. All righty, I was just going to look. We've got, um, we have two public hearings this evening, uh, one on the comprehensive land use plan. Well, they're both about that. Um, and it looks like some of you have signed up for that. So you have an option. You, you can certainly, as I call your name, you're more than welcome to step forward and speak. Um, during the public hearing, there's no requirement to sign up. So you can either speak twice or you can wait for the public hearing. It's your choice, okay? All right, first up is uh, Mark Pinshorn. If you would, please, as you step up, uh, give your name and address for the record. Thank you. Good evening, members of the commission, city staff, citizens. I am Mark Penshorn. For the last 20 plus years, I have maintained a dental practice in the city of Schertz. That's not why I'm here. Um, I also happen to live at 8320 Trainer Hale Road, uh, where I live on several hundred acres of family land that has been producing agricultural commodities by me and my ancestors since 1852. I have lived on that land my whole life. Uh, that land also happens to be approximately 1,500 feet from the new proposed subdivision area on Trainer Hale Road, which is why I'm here. Um, so to, to digress slightly, a little over a decade ago, the city of Shirts approached me and my neighbors about the idea of leaving the San Antonio ETJ and becoming part of Shirts ETJ. Uh, they wanted us to be in favor of that because apparently the city of San Antonio wanted us to be in favor of leaving San Antonio rather than church just taking it. So um, having already moved my dental practice to Schertz, I was, that was a reason I did that. Schertz was doing city better than any of the other small towns around here. I was in Converse the preceding 19 years, so um, Schertz was a much better alternative. I still think Schertz is doing city better than anybody else around. Um, in any event, the neighbors all agreed that it would be better to leave San Antonio and join Schertz. Schertz told us that we're not going to annex you guys for a long time. Well, a year later, they annexed the area, which didn't make anybody out there very happy. But they said, don't worry, we'll take good care of you, you agricultural people, because we're going to zone the area agricultural and estate, which means only one house to every five acres. It's like, fine, that sounds pretty good, which they did. So tonight we're here to talk about scrapping that plan and putting in some residential areas, which from my point of view doesn't feel like Schertz is taking very, very good care of me. Um, not necessarily reneging on a promise because it was no promise made, but on the other hand, um, the area that I live in has been agricultural since Europeans arrived. Um, there are two of us that have Texas Heritage recognized agricultural properties between Trainer Hill Road and Interstate 10. 
and there's only about 6,000 in the whole state of Texas, so it's kind of a unique thing, which means 100 years of continuous use, and there's multiple families out there that have third generations living on the land, so we're not just hobby farmers. Um, so that's, that is that whole thing, but my biggest concern about this new subdivision is not the noise and the traffic and the people that don't respect property, drive over fences, scare livestock, which still happens now. Uh, my biggest concern is water. And I'm not talking about the water you drink or that you flush your toilets with. I'm talking about the kind that falls out of the sky. Um, in 1972, there was the first major flood after the big droughts of the 50s. And that, that flood wiped out a trailer park neighborhood in what's now Pickerel Park. Um, it was the largest flood that had been seen on the Cibolo Creek since 1913. My grandfather was alive for both of them and he did attest to that. It was the biggest flood. Uh, since that time, there have been seven or eight rain flood events that have approached and one exceeded a 100-year flood event. Um, so what does all that mean and where I'm going here? After the 72 flood, we had major erosion on our property. We contacted the uh, USDA soil conservation people, asked for help. They did provide help. They provide financial help and they provide engineering help. Um, so part of the engineering help was to determine what water drained into our property and through our property to the creek. The map they provided us showed that our place drains 750 acres. Less than 100 of that is something I, I own. Um, the, the land that is being considered on Trainer Hale for the subdivision, two of the properties, the Burton Nagel property and the Wiederstein property. Burton Nagel property, according to the map I have, which was done in 1972 or three, about two thirds to three quarters of that drains through my neighbor Charlie Linsman's place into my place across Weir Road. The Wiederstein property, over half, drains from their property to the property that's between their property and Weir Road which then drains across Weir Road and then into my property. The point of that whole conversation is, I do not want more water in my place. Just the local rain in 1998, getting out from my house, we drove through water that made the pickup truck look like a boat. We had a wake in front of the bumper. And even the rain we had several weeks ago, the biggest little downpour we had of about two or three inches, I drove through about a foot and a half of local water on my road to get out. That's normal. But I, I, you know what happens when you put houses, rooftops, asphalt, and concrete down. The water doesn't just stay in the field anymore. It goes somewhere. And that somewhere, I really don't want to be me. Um, so I'm asking you guys to really, and the city staff in particular, do not let them design a subdivision that is going to flood me out. First of all, it wouldn't be nice, and second of all, I will seek legal counsel if that happens. Um, I would love to have a copy of all of the site plans to run by engineers of my choosing to see if they meet reasonable standards. I know that many of the standards are 25-year flood events. We've had seven bigger than 25-year flood events in the last 50 years. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. <coughs> Next up is uh, Anthony Vander Hayden. Good evening, I'm Anthony Vanderheiden. I live on uh, Woman Hollering Road. And uh, part of the plan that you're proposing um, is of concern to us for several reasons. And one is also flooding and drainage. The uh, area that's being proposed for development 
drains uh, directly into our land. We live at 12737 Woman Hollering Road. In uh, 2001, we had a flood there, and Woman Hollering Road was under a foot of water as the water came through our property towards Woman Hollering Creek. That was in 2001. That's the only flood that I'm aware of, but it did happen, and it affects our property directly. So that's one concern. Uh, I have a question concerning the buffer, 200 foot buffer, uh, perhaps you'll explain that when you discuss it, but it shows 200 foot buffer along the back of our property, which comes out to about three acres of land on our property. So I'd like to have you address that, what that entails, why is there a buffer, and if it entails any kind of curtailment of our rights as owners of property, of that property, do, are we reimbursed for any of that? So what is the buffer? What's its purpose? How is it going to be used? And uh, also the timeline for the development. I would like for you to address that, if you would, please. Are we talking months, years, decades, maybe? Um, and that's it. So if you would answer those questions when you address that, I'd appreciate it. All right, sir, are you talking, you, let me hit the buffer real quick here, that red line that goes around, the, okay, that's the notification. That's, I'm sorry, say that again? That's the, uh, that marks the, state law requires that any action to rezone property, anyone that lives within 200 feet of that property receives official notice. And that's what that red line is. It has nothing to do with your property. It doesn't restrict anything? No, sir. It's just, it, it's the way, it's way staff, and she'll probably address that during her presentation, right? So the, the red line that you would see on the public hearing notice map, as Commissioner Allah was saying, is that it is a noticing requirement. So that 200 foot buffer has no implications on your property whatsoever. It is just for our GIS department to take the property that is requesting, for example, this comp plan amendment. They draw that blue line around the subject property. They then create that 200 foot buffer, which is our indication to staff that, okay, within that 200 feet, we have this number of properties we need to send notice to, and that's all that that is. So it's not any implication on your property whatsoever. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Um, next up, uh, Kathy Pinsorn. Good evening. I'm Kathy Pinsorn. I'm married to Mark. I also live at 8320 Trainer Hale Road. Um, I just want to add that the, the water issue is is really important and it's also affects public safety from a police and fire standpoint if that water design isn't done well that area is going to get trapped because on one side of access you've got with the uh, Cibolo Creek at Weir Road which everybody knows floods all the time it's the first thing to flood on the other side you've got Woman Holler and Creek which is going to flood more quickly in two places one across Trainer Hale and one across 1518 this drainage has the potential to impact both of those intersections. And then on the, the other ex, uh, exit is Interstate 10, and of course the bridge is out. So <laughs> um, it's important that they, the engineers use smart guidelines, not just check the box on the minimum qualifications. The minimum qualifications will only create more headaches for the city of Schertz and for the neighborhoods. Um, I would also just like to point out that everybody on that surrounding property, all those surrounding property have cattle. All those surrounding pro property have, have active agricultural use and we need Mr. Felder and that new developer to be a good neighbor to who's already there and the city of Shirts can lead the charge there and represent us well. Thank you. You're welcome. Faye Sewell, did I say that right? Hi, I'm Faye Sewell. I live at 10792 Texas Valley Shirts. Uh, my husband and I have been out there 37 years. Um, our property is the only home our sons have ever known. And 
The plan was to at some point leave it to them. Um, it's building up all around us. I know that's part of progress. But I think the city of Schertz really needs to look at the infrastructure and have some of that in place. It seems like the homes are coming first and then we're worried about everything else. We're worried about the schools second. We're worried about the roads second. And I think our schools need, they're overcrowded as it is. I think y'all need to take into account that. The roads, particularly 1518 and Schaefer Road, y'all need to look at that before any more homes come out there. And y'all already have Rhine Valley that's not complete. I don't know how many more homes are coming in there. You've got Halley's Cove. It's not built out yet. I don't know how many homes are coming in there. You've got Crossvine that's now building towards 10. Everybody feeds in to 1518. And then you've got Saddle, uh, Saddlebrook that's a lot of homes. Yesterday, I was driving to Lavernia. It was 515. I was on FM 1518. I was stopped around Halley's Cove. It took me 16 minutes to get from there to 10. That's every day for all those people. Everything feeds into 1518. So I'm just asking, maybe the building of these subdivisions needs to slow down or stop for a while until the schools can get caught up and particularly the roads can get caught up. Thank you. You're welcome. Dave and Joyce Shoemaker. Good evening. I'm Joyce Shoemaker, and my husband Dave and I live in Homestead. We are here tonight to place as a matter of record our discussion to the developer of Homestead and to get it documented, we as homeowners would like the developer to fix the problems that are currently existing within our neighborhood before they're able to expand and open other sections. We have drainage issues. We have a swamp that has developed in our green belt that was a gorgeous green belt when we moved in three years ago. It's now a swamp. And we have repeatedly asked for these things to get fixed within our neighborhood. I know there are other homestead residents here tonight. We just want our voices to be heard to the developer and respectfully request that they fix what they're responsible for before the city of Shirts allows them to tear up any more land out there. Thank you. You're welcome. Jennifer Martorelli. Good evening, gentlemen, ma'am. My name is Jennifer Martorelli, uh, and I'm part of the Best Community Insurance, also known as Homestead. Specifically, I live at 5014 Winkler Trail. <clears throat> Even the best community uh, needs help from time to time. I believe that our developer and builders are not practicing um, oh, sorry. I believe uh, even the best communities need help from time to time. That stated, we need your help to align our issues with the developer and our builders within our wonderful community to actionable and accountable plan of action to rectify these issues. City of Church core value number one is do the right thing. I believe our developers and builders are not practicing this. We have serious issues with water, excessive water, runoff, standing water, which is now becoming a, a, a mosquito, uh, attracting mosquitoes. We have drainage issues. I am not a subject ma ma matter expert at this at all. I'm hoping that you are, or at least you employ people that could come and help us with this serious, more than serious water issue. We have <clears throat> previously communicated these concerns to the HOA management company that the developer and builders are hiding behind, oh, excuse me, um, hired to deal with us homeowners. Our roads are being affected by excessive water running down specifically Crockett and Mason Valley onto Winkler Trail. We have requested the town's assistance 
in the lake, and I do mean lake between my house and my neighbors, it has now become a standing body of water. It has moss. We have waiting for toads and things to develop there. It's not just a little puddle. It's a, it's a lake between our house. Um, developers and builders are saying, no, not our problem. You have to go to the town now. So we're getting the runaround there. Um, and we have that on record as well for someone to come help us. Uh, the only time the water's not there is when we have a, several days of excessive heat. It dries up then it comes right back from regular water from the sky and from the drainage down the hills of Crockett and Mason Valley. Valley. Um, we have, uh, we've requested the town, blah, blah, blah. Um, residents up on Tarrant Hill, that's another part of our development on the top part, um, have water and a foul odor. I don't believe anyone that should have to have standing water and more specifically a foul odor. Um, we were informed that the HOA has hired a company, an outside company, um, I believe it's called C.C. Connor, uh, but we need your help to have line of sight that these issues are taken care of. At this point, as homeowners and residents, we feel as if we're just getting the yes and nothing's happening. That's why we want to make sure we have a public record. Um, we have a low level of trust and resolution, as you can imagine, that's several people here are probably attest to, um, that we, we need your help with your oversight. Um, in, in especially in the, in the area of water. Uh, the sewers on Winkler Trails are still being blocked. I was informed that this was to prevent um, mud and, and, and garbage and building materials, which makes sense uh, from when there's an active build. However, this section is done and they're still blocked up. So all that stewing is, we're not even draining the water that's supposed to drain because they're all blocked. So at, at times we've tried to clear it, and one time I asked them to clear it because it was full of rubbish and trash and leaves, and they did, and we had some water effectively drain off the street, but now it's just back to where it started. Um, the green belt that was just mentioned, um, it's, be it's, off, it's between Homestead Parkway and Winkler Trail, was beautiful, green, luscious, and people you know, took trust in the fact that they wanted to build there, and that's what they wanted to have as as their view. It is now uh, mosquitoes and, and overgrown and garbage and trash and it needs to be rectified. The HOA um, management company has had people come in to spray. Well, we shouldn't be spraying for mosquitoes. We need to get at the source, which is go back to the where the plan originally was. Um, uh, neither the developer nor the builders are adhering to the second city core value of do the best you can. We have three uh, water mud hazards on the walking trail behind Winkler Trail and three on the same walking trail on the main entrance of Homestead Parkway. I'm not sure if you've ever driven through our development, but one of the features is a five mile walking trail. It's beautiful, it's supposed to be beautiful. However, as a dog walker myself, and I have complained about this, there's hazards. Because of all the excessive water, the drainage is now going onto the path. Um, and at times, it brings mud. And if any of you know and ever walked on mud, it's as slick as ice. As a former New Yorker, I know what it's like to go down on black ice. And, and we don't want slip and falls. We have residents and children that don't need this hazard. We need your help. <clears throat> um, Additionally, we need more lighting on the property. Um, as I said before, as a dog walker, we have receptacles on our property, which I use to put um, the dog poop bags in. Uh, we have 12 steps that go down from Winkler Trail onto the actual walking path where there is a station. At night, I can't see that well. Um, I've asked, even if it's solar, if it's, a, if it's an issue of cost, can they at least put some solar lights just so that we have visibility that nobody trips down the steps for myself or for anybody else in, still to this date hasn't been addressed. Um, the former builders on site, specifically Perry, um, he's no longer on site. Um, he would manage the workers, um, and I believe that, don't quote me, but I believe this might be actually part of their assessment or their actual written documentation. They're supposed to clean up when they leave the site every day. And by that, I just mean sweep the street or at least move all the building materials. Again, as a dog walker, I can tell you on a daily basis, I'm picking up nails. And I, there might be several people behind me, but my family, we are now on a first name basis with everybody down here at discount tire because of all the nails. So in the beginning, they were doing the right thing, which is one of your core values. They were sweeping the streets. Now they're just a mess. We've got you know builders running amok. We've got Felder leaving. I guess with that, maybe they've got their focus on other developments. So they're not doing the right thing. They're dumping materials. So we, we need your help. Um, 
Lastly, we wanted to uh, alert you that we may need to come back and address your help and, and uh, give you some line of sight to some issues we're having with our swimming pool and our splash pad. Splash pad has really been inoperable for almost its existence. It's had days where it's worked, but for the most part, um, they, it doesn't work. Um, and we're getting the run around there. At this point, I'm ready to say, let's do a forensic accounting, get back all the money you've put into this, and show some accountability and fix it. We have lots of residents, again, that bought there with young children children that came there for one of the beautiful things was the splash pad and our swimming pool, which has cement and issue, uh, tile issues that are apparently being addressed. I, again, I'm like from Missouri, the show me state. When I see it, I'll believe it. Haven't seen it yet. Um, the other thing was, um, I don't want to sound unkind, but I'm also feeling that a little bait and switch is going on. When, when I first purchased there, the site map uh, showed a dog park, showed um, some green space, um, and now the developers are changing that, which I assume is okay if they run it by you, um, but I want to hold them to some accountability that you've sold us on a bill of goods, don't bait and switch us, and now all of a sudden it change your plans for the development, and you know, whatever. Deliver on what you're supposed to be doing when you all first got there. Um, I, I just want to thank you for your time. Look forward to having your, your, your oversight of the home stuff developers and builders, especially as um, they're nowhere near complete and we'll be dealing with this issue for several, year, several more years. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Uh, Deborah Javit. Good evening. My name is Deborah Jewett. I live on Mason Valley <laughs> in Homestead. Um, not only is the drainage a major issue for the area, the roads as well. With the water standing in the roads, it's causing the pavement to erode. And it is constantly having potholes. The city comes out. They throw some gravel in it two weeks later. They throw some gravel in it, and it's just not getting fixed. It's just getting really bad. Um, Homestead Parkway, the way the contractors and the, the construction people fly in and out with their trucks is very unsafe for the kids. Um, there's housing development on this side, playground on this side, and semis coming through at 45, 50 miles an hour. We need a sidewalk and we need some speed bumps because during the summertime or breaks, there's kids walking across that road trying to get to the playground or summertime trying to get to the pool or the park or, you know, whatever's over there that does work. But half the time, nothing works over there anyhow. Um, the drainage, yes. When I moved in two years ago, the major selling point to my home was the Greenway. It was beautiful, it was mowed, it looked gorgeous. But within that two years, it doesn't get mowed. It is mosquito infested. I cannot sit out in my back porch. I cannot have guests over in my backyard without getting attacked by mosquitoes. I have complained to the HOA. I have tried contacting CCMC. I've tried contacting every address that I can possibly come up with. And nothing gets done. Nothing at all. We don't even get a response. Overgrown weeds, dead trees, the hoses showing through the plants. But yet, if my yard doesn't get mowed every two weeks, I get a letter in the mail. But yet, they can have dead trees, dead grass, dead plants, hoses all over the place. But it's supposed to be a beautiful, beautiful resident. Um, the amenities, where should I start? I've been there two years. Moved in August 22nd of 2019. Splash pad has never worked. 
broke my foot on the pool because it was crumbling and falling apart. Now it's doing the same thing. They were supposed to have fixed it. The edge is crumbling, falling apart in the pool where it's two feet for the little kids to play on is deteriorating. There's mess showing. They tell you, just stay away from it. Just avoid that area. Um, the bathrooms, it's pretty bad when I gotta stand outside the women's room so my husband can go to the bathroom because the men's room is locked and nobody can get it open because the key fobs don't work. The fireplace, that doesn't work. The grills, for a while they weren't working. Then they got stolen. Then they put them in and then they don't work. Can't use them with a key fob. They put a timer on it. What good is a timer if you're cooking out? You got hamburgers on the grill, 20 minutes later, it's gonna shut off on you. Hmm, that steak's undercooked. The fan, it's a big ass fan. That's the name of it, sorry. It doesn't work, it's got one speed, extremely low. So when it's hot out and you're sitting in the pavilion, there's no way of changing the, the speed of the fan. The gates, they're supposed to be private gates to get into the pool. Half the time the key fobs don't work. They prop them open with a chair. If it's not propped open, you gotta take your kid, put them over the fence so they can unlock it and let you in. And we have people from another community center coming into our community center and using our pool. I mean, that may not be nothing that you can deal with, but I mean, we're paying HOA fees for amenities that we can't use because they're falling apart. I hate taking my grandkids over there, but yet the teenagers in the next community come over at night and tear up the place. Oh, I'm sorry. Any veterans here? Don't you appreciate it when the flag is at half staff? Ours never is. It's not now, hasn't ever since I've been there. That's two years. We've tried sending, I personally have tried sending emails, like I said, to every email address that I have been able to come up with. We even had a town hall about two weeks before Thanksgiving. And we were supposed to let them know what we thought and what was going wrong and what needed to be done. As promised, just like they do for the last two years, we're looking into it, we're getting it done. We have someone doing that. We have someone looking into that. It'll get done. We, haven't, we still haven't gotten any answers from the Q&A town hall, have you? Builder? My builder is Perry Home. I will never, ever recommend anyone to Perry Home. I've been there two years. I'm still fighting to get my warranty work covered. I have a stove in my garage that I can't get installed. I have been after Perry home for the last two years to get my warranty work done and they can't do it. And it is still not done to this day. And if you'd like to see the hundreds of emails that I've sent to Matt Matthews, to Miss Bright, we have Claire. I mean, I've got like a whole list of people. I'll show them to you. But thank you for your time. Having a little trouble reading the next one. What? 
Yeah, I just. I'm sorry. I've been a little lenient with the uh, with the time for the speakers, and I've sort of been. Um, it looks like Valerie Hartman. It's there's it's something. Bert. Six six. 621 Burt Nagel it's out of Seguin. That's you? Okay. And uh, Rachel Munoz. Hello, my name is Rachel Munoz. I live at 6526 Crockett Cove in the Homestead community as well. Um, I'm not going to rehash everything that the ladies have already said this evening. Um, but I work for a heavy civil construction company myself. Um, I'm the office manager. And I know as a construction company um, that um, does work for Textod and for the city of San Antonio, the city of Shirts as well, and other cities here around the area, um, we have to obey guidelines and obey procedures and um, clean up. If we don't, we get the contract taken away from us and there's a big repercussion. And so it's kind of frustrating as a resident, you know, knowing the side of construction um, that the people here um, for the city of Shirts is continuing to allow the developer um, to continue to expand Homestead when um, possibly the developer and the construction companies that are there aren't doing their due diligence and probably what they're contracted to do in the correct manner. And as far as I know, I'm not seeing any repercussions. Um, <clears throat> I would like to add to what some of the ladies have already said today um, in regards mainly, I guess, to construction and the cleanup. Um, the cleanup crews, um, well, let me go back. The construction companies aren't constructing the houses, what I feel, in a timely manner. Um, I have a house directly across the street from me and also directly next door to me um, that have been stalled. No construction workers there in over eight months. Um, there's um, bricks and rocks. Um, that are going to be used in construction for those houses that have weeds and grass growing up through them. Um, the SW3P procedures um, are not being maintained. Um, the silt fence is either broken, have holes, or missing on a whole side of it. Um, so then that has to do with drainage and stuff getting into the stormwater drains that shouldn't be happening. Um, Trash wrappers, you know, further up the street on active homes that are happening. Trash wrappers, people's personal trash from the construction workers. Um, broken pieces of wood, broken bricks um, are in the street, not just there on the edge of the street, but in the middle of the street. Um, when it rains, everything comes down the street, not just an over uh, amount of water, but all of the trash and the debris that they haven't cleaned up in an appropriate manner. Um, so it's, um, like I said earlier, impeding in the uh, stormwater drains, which can affect many other residents outside of Homestead. Um, there's porta potties that are turned over in the street. I myself have called the porta potty company for them to come pick it up. Uh, I don't know if the uh, construction companies are just doing what they need to do on site and not using the porta potties, um, but that shouldn't be happening. Um, I do feel that there's maybe a lack of communication with the developer and what's actively happening in the community. I don't know if the developer hasn't been driving through the community and seeing really what's um, going on or what's not going on. Um, but um, I'm here to just mainly say why is the city of Shirts going to continue to allow the developer to um, make Homestead larger when they can't continue, they can't complete in an appropriate manner what they've already supposedly been supposed to do. Am I making sense? <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you make, you make perfect sense. I understand the question. Thank you. Um, all I can say is, wow, I, I don't know what to say. Um, a lot of the things that the Homestead folks have addressed are not within the authority uh, of, this, of this particular body. Can, can you help me out, Miss, Mr. James? Is the is the city aware of, of any of this these things? Yeah, no, I, I will have to say. Let me and let me offer this, and, and I appreciate the comments. I was not aware of it, and I'm going to be clear. That's not to say the city wasn't aware. So what I'm going to go back do in the morning is talk to all the departments that are related and find out. Hey, what calls? What complaints? Check three one one and go for it. Um, before the homestead folks leave. If I can get you to get with Emily, let me get your name, your address, your phone number, your email address, um, and we'll reach back out to it. So again, 
first time hearing of it. Uh, it's not say. Okay, thank, thank you. Let me let me offer this, but that doesn't mean there aren't folks in the city working on it. Right. Let me dig and take a look, and let me see what we can do working with them. Okay. Forward on some of the items. And and you know, as far as allowing Homestead to continue to expand, um, a lot of what we do here. Um, we're bound by legal constraints, and there are uh, there are processes that are set down that, uh, you know, if, if if they cross all their T's and dot all their I's, the state law says I can't say no to them. There's a lot of things like that, but um, maybe we'll maybe I'll start a discussion. Maybe we can get with staff and I, I so and I'll look to see if there's anything we can do. Okay. That, that's all I can. That's all I can suggest. Um, no, sorry. Um, okay. I'm just, um, you know, I'm an old school guy. I've been been around for a long time, and to hear things like that, it's um, and, and knowing what you folks are paying for those houses up there, really. Um, Again, I don't know what to say to it. All right, move, moving along here. Um, item number four is our consent agenda. Item A, the minutes for the November 17th, 2021 regular meeting. Item B, PC 2021-050, consider and act upon a request for approval of a final plat for unit six of the Homestead subdivision, approximately 5.35 acre tract of land generally located approximately 1,900 feet from the intersection of Schwab Road, Kimball Way, City of Shirts, Guadalupe County, Texas. Item C is PC 2021-051, consider and act upon a request for approval of a final plat for unit eight of the Homestead subdivision and approximately 40 acre tract of land generally located approximately 1,000 feet from the intersection of Kimball Way and Schwab Road, City of Schertz, Guadalupe County, Texas. Item D is PC 2018-003 EXT. Consider and act upon a request for approval for a time extension for the final plat of the Crossvine module two unit one subdivision an approximately 15 acre tract of land generally located approximately 1,000 feet southwest of the intersection of FM 1518 and Lower Seguin Road, City of Shirts, Bear County, Texas. Commissioners, do we need to pull any of these items for discussion? Mr. Commissioner, I'd like to pull item D. All right, uh, we'll pull item D from the consent agenda. Any others? If not, Chair will entertain a motion. I'm sorry, what's that? No. So that's it. If you want to talk about them, we have to pull them off the consent agenda. All right. So that leaves us with just item A, minutes for the November 17th, 2021 regular meeting. Mr. Chairman, I motion to approve item A from the consent agenda. I have a motion to approve by Commissioner Platt. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second by Commissioner Ray. There's no discussion. Call for the vote. Aye. 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 Five ayes, none opposed. That motion passes. So, Item 4B, PC 2021-050, consider an act upon request for approval of a final plat for Unit 6 of the Homestead subdivision. Mr. James? Yes, sir, thank you. And, and I don't know what the commission would prefer. What we have is a subdivision plat for the next phase of the Homestead subdivision. As uh, Chairperson Outlaw indicated, subdivision plats are considered non-discretionary. Essentially, our ordinance in the city of Sherds is largely based upon what's allowed in the Texas local government code. Um, and, and then we can craft particular reg regulations not in conflict with that. But inherently, subdivisions plats are non-discretionary. If they meet the requirements of our code, the commission is obligated 
to approve them. And, and I certainly can appreciate that at times. That's frustrating for, for the commission. Uh, I can certainly appreciate that's frustrating for the residents who are here saying we have this whole range of issues we're living with and dealing with today. Um, and, and certainly, again, I want to try to chat with some of those folks um, and, and see what we can do in terms of things the city should be doing and things that perhaps we can facilitate. Um, but, but perhaps if you, if, if I understand what you'd like to cover with, with the discussion yeah, well, on pulling the item. Tonight, mm -hmm. and yet we're going to let these guys continue down mm -hmm. the road. Where's their fix and where's the fix coming for the next two plots? Sure. And, and so, so let, let me be kind of clear. That's something that I certainly want to have a conversation with the residents about to understand their concerns and issues. And as I said, I may go back and find from staff, yep, we've been trying to get this and this and this dealing with or, or whatnot, or, or we've been lax on dealing with it, whatever the case may be, and see what we can do in terms of where the city has a code requirement to deal with it, and then in terms of what we can do to try to facilitate that, where we may not have the power to make it happen, but see what we can do to, to try to get a solution. Uh, my comment simply is this, and I appreciate y'all's patience. I tend to over talk and I apologize to folks, but we don't have the ability to use the plat approval as leverage on those issues. That's, that's fundamentally the case. Okay, but is there another legal venue that we can hold a developer accountable for what they are or are not doing according to the agreement on everything that we've approved? Sure. So, so to, to be clear in terms of things that we have approved, and I'll, I'll kind of cover the, the, the list of things. So the developer fundamentally in terms of zoning is obligated to comply with the zoning. So where it stipulates lot sizes have to be this, setbacks have to be this, the lotting pattern has to be this, they have to comply with that. Again, the plats comply with that at this point. Um, with regard to plat approval, they have to comply with the city's regulations in, in terms of that. Um, but the issues that we're hearing about generally, I think, and, and I'm fairly confident, aren't really having to do that. They have to do with kind of the ongoing maintenance that has to occur and the things that occur during construction of, of homes and whatnot. Certainly where we have a development agreement on something, that would come into play, but again, not really a factor here. And so let me touch on a few of the things that, that we sort of heard about. So we do have uh, a stormwater ordinance. We have requirements for, for SWIP controls, as I think was referenced. Um, and certainly, fair enough that we need to go back out and take a look at that and see what's going on. And again, ideally, I'd like to say I wish we're up top of that with every neighborhood. But if you've dealt with that, it is an ongoing challenge, not an excuse, simply an explanation. And so certainly, what we'll do is go back out, revisit their stormwater control measures. That's important enforced in part by the engineering inspectors and the building inspectors, whether it's, and then they kind of work hand in hand, but whether it's during construction of the subdivision, so the comment with regard to the stormwater manager at the inlet, and should that still be there, or should that have been pulled out, and then as well as lots. So that's a hammer we have with codes that we can go back out and look at. We also have the ability to go back out and look at construction debris, the restroom requirement, mud on the roads, things like that. Again, I'm gonna be clear, even with our codes, we, we may not get to the standard that everybody says, wow, this is really great. There's not a nail out here. There's not trash that blows around ongoing problem. But again, from what I've heard, it, it goes well beyond that. And so again, you know, I'd like to make it go away. Let's see if we can make it better so the residents go, oh, it's pretty good, not perfect like anything and get there. So we have regulations on that. We do have regulations with regard to our stormwater ordinance, again, that goes to those drainage areas and the detention areas. And so again, we can go back out and take a look and see what's happening. And again, Dr. Pinshorn had some good comments as I look for him and don't see him at this point. There he is. Part of it goes into your engineering design on the front end. Part of it goes into how that's constructed. But then part of what happens, frankly, is what happens with maintenance of that. And so as folks around here are familiar, with Deets Creek within the last year, you've seen the city go out and desilt that, for example. That's a common occurrence. What happens, despite the best stormwater control measures, but if you don't have those in good shape, you tend to get more silt, that disrupts the grading, that disrupts the flow. And I will tell you, having walked a subdivision Tuesday morning, I think Tuesday morning, can't remember, for about three and a half hours, often what happens is they don't get that grading quite right 
it tends to exacerbate over time and it quickly grows. And so there are things that we can do to address the particular problems, and the city should do that regardless. Sorry it took folks having to come here and be as frustrated as they are, but, but what I will say is we have to go through those avenues. Again, we do not have the power to hang up the plats because of these other frustrations. Don't get me wrong, I can certainly appreciate the residents. It, it resonates, seems fairly obvious. Residents believe they're having trouble managing this stuff. Why would we add more to it, get a greater workload, becomes a bigger challenge. But as you know as a commissioner and the training you go through and the things we do and the things that we talk about, we're restricted in terms of what your powers are. And again, you don't have the power to hold up the plats for those reasons. You have to find some reason in the code that the plat doesn't comply with. Occasionally staff will miss some and commissioners will catch those, but that's not what seems to be the case here. It's these sort of side issues. So I can certainly appreciate the frustration, but what I don't want to do, part of my job is to advise the commission in terms of where you have powers to do things and why, and part of it, frankly, is having conversations with residents. And I may not always tell you what you want to hear, but hopefully I kind of tell you straight and, and then see what we can do to work together. And so to, to try to deal with the plat would not be a fruitful effort. We need to focus on these other areas that, that we have going forward to try to deal with those, and certainly I'm committed to do that again. I want to remind everybody to catch Emily from Homestead before they go, get name, address, phone number, email address. We can, we can take a couple days to do some research on what we may have been hearing, reach out to understand specific, uh, specifics, and do some site visits. So again, don't get me wrong, Commissioner Ray, I can appreciate the frustration, but, but our goal is to see what we can do to tackle the problems that we're able to with the tools we have. And, and again, I apologize, I tend to go on and on as I said before. I'll use Commissioner Outlaw who, who served on TSAC as an example in the past, which is our Transportation Safety Advisory Committee. And often they deal with speeding issues in neighborhoods and that's one of the things that, that we heard here. And a lot of times with that committee they would get folks showing up saying, I want you to put in a speed hump put in a speed hump and, and staff often says let us figure out what's going on because while putting in a speed hump may placate folks it may not actually make the situation better and what we'd like to do is try to make the situation better not simply placate folks and often the solutions are more complex than that and then additionally you don't want to create other problems that, that you didn't anticipate so again I, I would remind folks inform the residents it's very frustrating at times to be a planning and zoning commissioner their hands are often tied. At times it doesn't make sense. Why do you bring these things to us to approve if we can't approve them or deny them? That's different than zoning cases and comp plan amendments that are discretionary. You get to decide if this is in keeping with the comp plan of the city and say yes or no to it. Unfortunately, subdivision plats are not that way. State requires them to come to you, but you're effectively required to approve them if they comply. So, so our engineering department can go out there and see if what the developer said they were going to do was actually done? Is that sure. What sure. So, so a couple things that we'll do, and so, so I'm going to tackle some of the comments that, that we heard because some aren't that, that field. But for example, I'll take the, the drainage way uh, coming off Homestead Parkway. Um, that's one that we'll go take a look at. And again, what we want to do is revisit what was supposed to have been built. Do we think it was built to that standard or did we miss something? And, and what do we think the problem might be that's occurring? And so it could be we come back and say, yeah, we missed something. It was not built the way it was supposed to have been. Or we might, may find that now it appears it was built the right way, but there's some other issue occurring. So for example, it, it could be the fact that we're having problems with erosion in the SWIP program and we're getting too much silt coming in and that's starting to clog it up. It could be what happened is that the grass there died, that some of the vegetation died, either in the freeze, whatnot, hadn't got, and then that's become the issue. And, and that's not the developer not building it right, that's the property owner which is the developer behind the HOA, not doing maintenance, would be a different department coming out working on that. So again, I wanna be clear, you will likely have the engineering department out there, you'll likely have the building inspections department out there, 
and you'll have neighborhood services going out there as well, probably with Public Works and some of the planning folks, to take a look, see what we're seeing, and figure out why we're having the problems we're having. Again, I'm going to be blunt and honest, and you know, part of what we need to figure out is, is the problem we're seeing unusual? Yeah, this is a problem, it shouldn't be happening. Or sometimes these are just the things that happen that may frustrate us that we need to do better at and kind of figure out where that is in terms of, so I'll use the example of some of those detention areas. They're intended to hold water when it rains and they're intended to slow release. So very often they look boggy and wet and muddy and things like that. But again, things we shouldn't have, mud washing over the sidewalk, continuing to stay that way. If we have that problem, figure out why it's happening, figure out what we need to do to fix it and go from there. So, so we'll tackle it, but I don't want to apply this is going to be a quick process. Don't want to apply we're going to come out with the best, but, but that's the avenue. Yeah, I, I need to interrupt here for just a second, gentlemen. I, I appreciate the comments and the explanation and, and the concerns, but I think we've strayed from the topic. And I, I even though our legal counsel isn't here tonight, I can hear him in my ear going, we need to bring it back. The, the subject we're discussing is the final plan of Unit 6. And um, it's kind of devolved into a discussion of the concerns of the Homestead resident. So I kind of need to bring it back on topic. And, and again, as, as Mr. James pointed out, and, and this is one of those ones where our, you know, the state state law is pretty specific. If it meets the requirements, we have to approve it. We have no discretion. They even toughen that up in the session prior uh, to the to the latest one uh, two years ago. That a nay vote now requires specific justification, and I have to be able to cite a rule, a regulation or a law that I can, you know, that I can claim this thing doesn't meet. If I can't do that, I can't vote no against it. I can, but I can end up in trouble with somebody, I suppose. So yeah. um, I, I think we've got a good start going here this evening. Commissioner, if, if, if you have some, if, if, if any of us, if you have specific questions about the final plat for Unit 6, Otherwise, I, th I think we need to move on. So we need a motion then to either approve or deny PC 2021-050. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve PC 2021-050 for the final plat of Unit 2 Homestead Subdivision. Oh, it's Unit 6, correct? Correction, yeah, yep. Unit 6. All right, so I have a motion to approve from Commissioner Odom. Do I have a second? Second. A second from Commissioner Goldick. Any further discussion, questions? Call for the vote. Aye. 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 Five ayes, none opposed. We move on to Item C, PC 2021-051. Consider an act upon a request for approval of a final plat for Unit 8 of the Homestead Subdivision. Commissioner Ray, once again, is there any? No. Okay. All right. So, Chair, I'll entertain a motion to either approve or deny PC 2021 051. Mr. Chairman, once again, I make a motion that we approve PC 2021-051 for Unit 8 of the Homestead Subdivision, final plat. Do I have a second? Second. All right, I have a motion to approve from Commissioner Odom and a second from Commissioner Goldick. Any further discussion or questions? Call for the vote. Aye. 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 Five in favor, none opposed. Motion passes. Item D, BC 2018-003 EXT, consider an act upon a request for approval for a time extension for the final plan of the cross line module two, 
Unit one subdivision, approximately 15 acre tract of land, generally located approximately 1,000 feet southwest of the intersection of FM 1518 and Lower Seguin Road, City of Church, Bear County, Texas. Mr. And, and if, you if, if I may real quick, can I apologize? Sure. If the folks who spoke on homesteads, the homestead items are, are through now, if you're welcome to certainly stay through the rest of the meeting. Um, but, but if you'd like, uh, Emily will meet you front, get your name and contact info. If you stay, catch her before the end of the meeting. Just didn't want it either for force to stay before that. Okay, Megan, before I think uh, Commissioner Platt had a specific question about this. Is that correct? It, yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> on this final plat, it, the description, the legal description, does not match the original 17-S-01, uh, um, which was the the original ordinance for this. It, I guess to provide more explanation, what is it that doesn't match? Uh, the cross find module two unit one subdivision description of <coughs> Find it real quick. And, and real quick, I'll interject here. If, you, if the Homestead people, if you'd like to give them your information and come back for the rest of the meeting, you're certainly welcome to do that too. Um. Under final subdivision, Plata Cross Vine Module 2, Unit 1. It's listed as a 14.08 acre tract of land out of the Julian Diaz survey number 66, abstract 187 county block 5059 out of the westerly portion of 100.966 acre tract of land as conveyed to shirts 1518 LTD of the record and volume yada yada. When you go through and read that and you go back to the ordinance uh, for this same section, it's listed differently. For the ordinance is, is in the PDD amendment? which would have been under the third amendment. It's listed as, I've got it up, hold on. It's listed as lot one, block seven of lot 56, block one of Sedona unit one. You said lot one, block seven? It is listed as lot one, block seven and lot 56, block one of Sedona unit one. So it, it'll take me some time um, because it, you know, it wasn't brought to my attention prior, so it is gonna take me time to essentially go through and, and, and to see unless- I apologize, um, not getting back to you sooner. I just saw it a few hours ago before coming out here. And so what you're, I guess with the, let me just make sure it's, it's clear. So the, the question is, there is a discretion between lot one, block seven, and lot 51 from the previous ordinance, which was the PDD third amendment, to the now final plat that's being shown tonight. Correct. Track two, uh, and I've got a page number, just page four under track two. And that's the description of what we're, discussing tonight is different than what we're discussing tonight. So what's originally there from from 17-S01, page four, track two, is different description than what's on ours tonight. Now if- So I, I, guess, that's the, I guess that's the other thing. Listed as this description and now it comes before us for an extension and it's listed as a different description, legal description. Okay, so I guess the thing too is that my page four for the third amendment is not going to, so I'm not sure if you're looking at which PDD amendment. Because I know there was a, I know there was a fifth amendment. It's ordinance number 17-S-01. It's referenced in the item D on our agenda today. Pull it back up for you. Is, is this plat exhibit? Now, we're not approving the final plat tonight, correct? This is just an extension of time for them to 
file their final, or to come up with their final plat, correct? You've already approved the final plat. Oh, okay. This is an extension for the construction that they, ah, um, okay. they're not able, they're in the process, they're, they're expiring on December 11th, so right. on, on Friday, Saturday is the expiration of the final plat. And so the purpose of the extension is to allow them a six month period to complete that construction. Um, so that is, that is why the final plat has been brought back as well as the um, extension letter. Um, so again, maybe I'm looking at it wrong or, or I'm confused. It happens often, but. It, uh, just under lot use to mention requirements, right under that section it says the plat was reviewed in accordance with the Cross Vine PDD Ordinance 12-S-16 and Amendment 17-S-01. That amendment is this picture, mm -hmm. is this final plat exhibit with a completely different description of that lot. Okay. So what I didn't know is what happened between the time that this amendment was in place with the exact same information to the time it came before us and it's been changed. So when it was reviewed there at the, there was no changes to my understanding to the plot itself. Um, so. Am I confused? Sure. So. These are supposed to be the originals. So you get one that was two years ago. So you just read it back to that original from the zoning listed differently as a different different plot, different number. The legal description is not the same. I'm kind of wrestling with this one myself. I, 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 I think I would compare the final plat to the preliminary plat, looking for changes rather than going all the way back to the the PDD ordinance. Yes. No. So, so I would say that too. So again, let me be clear and kind of the last time we have. So it needs to comply with the zoning. And, and comply doesn't mean it has to be matched exactly, but I want to understand the difference. And then really what you've got is the final plat needs to, needs to be consistent with the preliminary plat. So I agree with Chairperson Outlaw, want to make sure the final matches the preliminary, and if we're good there, that's good. And then we want to make sure we haven't missed something on the zoning that should have caused us not to approve either the preliminary or the final. And so let us take a look and make sure that that the difference between the zoning and the final plat isn't typical of that because what you cover in the zoning doesn't always match the, the platting. Sometimes it's pretty close, other times it's different because in the zoning, sometimes you know that's why we that's why a lot of the time you see in your staff reports approximately. 15 acres, approximately, because if we start, I mean, there's times I can have acres that has 36.2156. I, I mean, it, it becomes, you know, a lot of digits, and so we essentially approximately 33 acres. And so there may be, like Brian was saying, there may be that kind of discretion where in the zoning we maybe had put approximately 15 acres, whereas, you know, on the legal description, it's obviously exact because the county's going to look at it. They're going to look at the tax certificate before before recordation. Um, so that may be where where that disconnect is. Is because of the zoning we maybe have said approximately 15 acres. Because um, like I said, there are times you can have a lot um, a lot of digits with those acreage. My but request would be, Commissioner, if I may, on this, if this kind of helps with what we have. So I'd like, if the commission would, to skip this item, to, to pause it, make a motion to move on to the next item, catch this at the end, and then let staff in this interim time period while we're going through the other items, they can pull the preliminary plat, file, they can go back to the office, pull the preliminary, pull the final plat, pull the zoning, run through those, and then we can give you a, a clean answer to that at the end. Because I think we're gonna spend some time on the comp plan amendments. Um, and that'll give staff time to do that and, and come back to this one. So we can, I want to make sure we give you an accurate answer. 
if, if that would be our recommendation. I have to ask how we do that. That requires a motion or just consensus? So I, I, I would say this, because we don't follow Robert's rules of order in particular, I think the chair could stay okay. going to do that. Barring objection, we do it. All right, so we'll move on to the, um, the rest of the agenda and return to this item uh, before adjournment. Is that all right, commissioners? Okay. Did you want this reference, Mr. James? Yes, but you can give it to me. It's all right, so item number five, a public hearing. The Planning Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing related to zone change requests and replats within this agenda. The public hearing will be open to receive a report from staff, the applicant, the adjoining property owners affected by the applicant's request, and any other interested persons. Upon completion, the public hearing will be closed. The commission will discuss and consider the application and may request additional information from staff or the applicant if required. After deliberation, the commission is asked to consider and act upon the following requests and make a recommendation to the city council if necessary. Now, I want to take just a minute because there seems to be a lot of interest in, in these this evening that all, the only authority we have is we, rec we make a recommendation to city council to either approve or deny this, this change. So uh, the final authority for approval or denial rests with city council. The point I'm making is this will be on their agenda sometime in the future. And so um, does public notice go out on that or just our public hearing? Okay. Anyway, so I just want to make you aware of that we're going to talk about it tonight, but the real decision will be sometime in the future at City Council, and you might want to watch for that. Okay, item A. 5A is ZC 2021-017. Hold a public hearing. Consider and make a recommendation on a request to amend the comprehensive land use plan by changing approximately 44 acres of the future land use map from fixed use mixed-use neighborhood land use designation to single family residential land use category generally located 3650 feet east of the intersection of schaefer road and fm 1518 also known as bear county property identification numbers 309807 309814 309837 city of shirts bear county texas presentation will be made and will solicit um, We'll certainly uh, open for public comments, and the commission may or may not uh, discuss the item, but no action will be taken on this item this evening. And are you going to explain why? Explain that. Okay. Okay. So again, Brian James, uh, City of Shirts, um, and, and I'll, I'll start with that. So to be clear with everyone who came out, and, and we're glad you did, because it does allow you to get up on the public hearing item. And, off, and ask your questions, offer your concerns, things like that. We can start get those, start thinking about it. But as you heard a little bit of the snippet before and what state law says we have to do on things, on comp plan amendments, one of the things that we have to do is we have to send out a property owner's notice, which many of you probably got something in the mail. I'm looking for some nods. Okay, thank you, that helps. Uh, saying, hey, there's this thing going before the Planning and Zoning Commission, there's a public hearing if you wanna be here. State law dictates we have to kind of word that in a particular way, and essentially what happened is we made an error. We, we messed up on the wording of that slightly in terms of what the current land use designation was, and, and we always wanna err on the side of caution, and so what we're gonna do, because we sent the notice, we have to have the hearing, but the commission can't act on it. It, it, it wouldn't be valid as it went through the process unless we got that right. So what's gonna happen is we'll hold the public hearing tonight, We'll solicit your comments. You're welcome to get up, and I'd encourage you to get up and give us those. The commission may ask a few questions of staff, but ultimately they're not going to act on it because of that notice. What's gonna happen is you'll get another notice in the paper, or you'll get another notice in the mail, and that notice in the mail will say, this item will come back on January 12th. I hate to tell you to come back out and spend your evening with us on a Wednesday night, but come back out and spend your evening with us on January 12th. And that's when we'll repeat the process. You can repeat your concerns and hopefully staff will be able to address some of those up front. You may like the answer, you may not. Um, and then at that point, the commission can act. As Commissioner Outlaw said, they're a recommending body on comp plan amendments. 
So once that occurs, the item will go to city council. We only do a legal notice for city council, which means if you ever read those things in the paper, those little blurbs about government hearings or bonds or tax rates or stuff like that, which nobody does, that's the only way you'd know about it. So you wanna check the city's website. We publish our agenda for council a couple weeks in advance. And when this comes back, staff will tell you this is when we think it's gonna go to council and you can keep an eye on the website for that so you know to show up at council because if you're really concerned, as Commissioner Outlaw said, Council makes the final decision. We repeat the process there and they wanna hear what you have to say, but we'll include kind of a summary so they have it in their packet to read going forward. So that's again a long-winded explanation. So I'll, I'll go through the presentation to kind of give a feel for what's occurring. So as many folks know, we have a, a couple of tracks that, that are being pulled together. It totals about 44 acres off Schaefer Road generally here, and again, these are the, the properties um, over here. Let me back up real quick to the aerial. You can see, um, let me get the map out here. We've got the school over here, the elementary school, the new Rose Garden Estates. Uh, Corbett is over right here to give you points of reference, which are often helpful for folks. As mentioned earlier tonight, the Saddlebrook development is generally in this area, which is the large residential development kind of coming in. So it's, it's up in this, this vicinity. Um, the issue on the notice is it made reference to the current uh, land use designation being mixed use core. It's not mixed use core, it's mixed use neighborhood. And I'll explain what mixed use neighborhood is. Um, but what the applicant is requesting is that it be redesignated to single family residential. And again, so that folks who don't often come out to this stuff sort of explain the way the process works. The real power the city has to dictate what happens on land, can it be used for a fast food restaurant? Can it be used for an industrial building? Can it be used for an office building? Can it be used for an apartment complex? Can it be used for single family homes? If so, what size do those lots have to be? That's done through zoning. In Texas, zoning for cities must be done in conformance with the city's comprehensive plan. So essentially, if the zoning someone requests isn't in conformance with the comprehensive plan, and that can at times be open for debate, staff would recommend you need to recommend denial. It's not in conformance with the comprehensive plan. Now the option though that folks have is they can request that the comp plan be amended. So they can come back and go through this process. And the way I would describe it is the comprehensive plan or the comp plan amendment takes a little bit of a, a bigger picture look whereas the zoning takes a little bit of a closer look going forward. So the comp plan and the land use plan sets the stage for zoning. In this case, because of that difference, the applicant is requesting a, a comprehensive plan amendment. Um, and, and again, I'll describe for folks, again, a couple of things we wanna touch on. So a gentleman made reference to this 200 foot boundary. Uh, there's concern that, hey, what is that doing to my property where that line runs through? As was stated earlier, state law says when we send those notices out to you, we have to send it to all properties or the owners of all property within 200 feet. So the property up for comp plan amendment is within the blue. The red line is generally the 200 foot notice area that goes out. So it's simply to let folks know, these are the folks that got noticed. If you're beyond that, you didn't get a notice. But then one of the things that happens is on some different cases, if more than a certain percentage, like on zoning cases, if more than a certain, if the owners of more than a certain percentage of land, it's worded particularly, oppose it, it requires a super majority of city council and that's typically zoning cases. But what we use this for is to highlight so that y'all know, because this is a discretionary item, unlike the plat, it, not that it's not important what people think on plats, but we really wanna know what they think on these zoning cases because we can either approve or deny. And so the map gives you a feel for which folks have come in in opposition, which folks are neutral, and then obviously as typically the case, 
with the green in favor, generally the person requesting, the owner requesting to be redesignated is always in favor of that redesignation. So you get that green. But just so folks understand that, that yeah, it's obvious to the commission, it's obvious to us. And so again, obviously in this case, we can look, most of the folks are not in favor of the zoning. Part of the public hearing is for you to get up and, and lay that out. The, the difference generally um, in, in terms of it to give the current comp plan exhibit on the property, as I said, is the property is zoned or designated per the comp plan um, as, as mixed use neighborhood. And essentially what that is, is because of its proximity to the intersection with 1518 in Schaefer Road and 1518 in Lower Seguin, our plan sort of centers to say, hey, in the southern part of Schertz, we're gonna kind of concentrate the higher intensity of the development aside from along I-10 in sort of this area generally. And so the idea is that as we concentrate that density, that commercial development at, at kind of along this section of 1518, we want more dense development along this. And so if you look at the comp plan in terms of how that describes it, it's intended for a mix of residential uses generally um, that come forward. So it's single family residential, it's cottages, which are typically smaller, denser units, patio homes, townhomes, um, and then live work units, which allows folks to work and live similar to, to a home-based occupation. Generally, it recommends the stories for that between one and three. So that's what the designation calls for. What the applicant essentially has said with ultimately what they want to do is just single family, particularly. And so they're coming in to redesignate the comp plan to single family residential. So we don't say, well, where are your cottage homes and where are your town homes and where are your live work units? They're walking in and say, we just generally want to do that first one, single family homes. Um, as, as a typical suburban style neighborhood. And so again, not that it's gonna be exactly like any of these, but to give a feel, likely their development pattern would be somewhat along the lines of Willow Grove, it'd be somewhat along the lines of Rhine Valley, could be somewhat along the lines of what Saddlebrook's going to come in with, things like that. And so that's what the request is. So again, staff would describe this as it's probably a less dense development not, not as many units because they don't have those mix going forward. And that's ultimately the, the, the request. I will offer this up, and, and, and I think staff is gonna take notes on the comments that we hear. To be clear, the property's not in the city limits yet. It's under a development agreement currently, so it's not zoned. So before they can develop, and many of you and Dr. Pinshorn referenced the development agreements as I look and again can't find where he went. Um, under development agreements, in lieu of the city annexing, we enter into those agreements with property owners. We amended a number of those to, to, to extend the time of that that the city wouldn't annex. But essentially they say if you want to develop or change the use, you've got to come in and request annexation. And so to develop the property, they would have to go through that process to request annexation. And then to do anything generally, they need to get zoning with that annexation. And that's ultimately the issue and goes back to the comp plan. Um, but I will say this, I suspect that a lot of the concerns we're going to hear tonight, maybe not all of them, I'm always surprised, have to do with the changing character of the area. And it, it goes back to when folks moved out here, it was fairly rural, and many of you were probably here before there were either elementary school, any homestead, or Willow Grove, before Rhine Valley, and you're probably not thrilled with a lot of the changes you've seen in terms of the traffic on 1518, in terms of, again, as Dr. Pinchorn referenced, people now traipsing on property, increased drainage runoff and things like that. So it's important that we get all of those concerns for you. I only say this to say, one of the things that we will sort of talk about is keep in mind and, and not that this has to sway, and you're probably gonna go, yeah, thanks, Brian, disagree, but if the applicant came in and requested zoning in conformance with the comp plan, we would tend to look favorably on that because that's what the plan calls for. The current designation tends to be a denser development than what's being proposed going forward. Folks may not like it, either one, 
and not like one more than the other, but just to sort of lay that out going forward. And so that's what the request that we have. Um, I would encourage folks, if you've not gone online to the city's website, under the government section, boards and commissions, you can pull up the agenda. It has this entire packet, so if you haven't seen the applicant's request for redesignation, redevelopment that describes what they want to do, I'd encourage you to do that to have a feel for it and to see all of the staff report and packet. Um, so again, I want to say this, that generally before we realized the notice, staff was in support of the amendment. We feel like it's in keeping with what's occurring. Um, but because of that notice error, we're not recommending that be acted on tonight, but we did want in light of the fact that people came out, let them know where staff was, was going on this so that we could hear concerns with that. And so again, there will not be action on this tonight. It'll come back on the 12th, but that's the staff presentation. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. James. Is the applicant here this evening? Did you wish to address the commission? All right, thank you. All right, so at this time, I'll open the, uh, the hearing for public input. Anyone wishing to address the commission on this subject is welcome to step up to the podium. Please give your name and address once again for the record and try to hold your remarks to three minutes if you could, please. It's Bay Soul 10792 Texas Valley. When I spoke earlier, I forgot to mention my main concern was on this public hearing number letter A and because we're adjacent to that property. But the other comment I was gonna say, on this side of 10 that's in shirts, I mentioned all the development that's going on already. I failed to mention on the other side of 10, it's just as many on that side. And they feed into 1518 and they go down to 78. So again, my main concern is the schools and the streets and if y'all can slow down all the subdivisions, I know the city of Shirts wants it for the money, for the tax revenue, but you have to think of the people too and what it means for all of us that live out there and drive it. I was out there before any of that was out there. And now these people come and it's like, do y'all not realize this is your only road in and out? And then they're complaining and I'm like, Y'all should have thought about that before you built. We're stuck with it because we were here before y'all came. But it's just like, I think the city just reacts after the subdivisions are in as far as the schools, because then you're playing catch up, and the roads, and then you're playing catch up. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? Hi, Tracy Campos, 12340 Schaefer Road. I didn't see our little star up there, but we're also against it. Um, Schaefer Road cannot handle the traffic that it has now, and you want to put how many houses out there? And it, it, at the light, the light has helped a little with the traffic going to the schools, except when it's flooded, and then they have to go around. And believe me, we love it when it floods, because we don't have traffic. We don't have people racing down the road all the time and people really do race down the road. Yes, and that, you know, the new design on it is fun. I've seen a few go airborne a little bit, but Safer Road cannot handle the traffic flow. And, and the other, if that Saddlebrook or whatever, that new subdivision, if they're gonna dump out on RAF Burnett, number one, the road, well, they chip sealed it, so it's not really a paved road. It cannot handle the traffic. There's the drainages intact because there was a big bond issue to put drainage. As you know, there's no sewer, there's water, there's that new water main. But traffic 1518 backs up on Schaefer Road. Well, it's backed up to our house and we're at the corner. And so that's nine tenths of a mile. And how are you gonna do that with more people coming in, and more houses inundating out there? And that's our biggest concern there. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, 
Hi, it's Kay Zimmerman, 11020 Texas Valley. We've lived out there almost 37 years. And although we don't want the homes, I know it's progress. But after listening to all these people speak tonight, especially the one from Homestead, it makes me really nervous to have 44 acres under construction. And where will the water and garbage and everything else be feeding to? I know y'all can't personally handle it. And I know there's laws and everything, but I wish when new developers are coming in that there's something something you can add that says they need to be responsible in the long run. Not just meet the requirements, they need to go above and beyond. I don't know if there are laws like that. I'm happy you're speaking in our favor, but I think something needs to be added to take care of everything. And when we were annexed 10 years ago, one of the big things that was mentioned was our area, they wanted to keep it the rural look, which meant larger lots, acre homes, two acre homes. To my knowledge, there is only one community that has, that has been done. All the other ones are just your normal size communities. So I'm hoping maybe this is the bigger ones so that the look can stay. But I, I just wish everything would slow down a little so things could be maintained better, especially Schaefer Road. I mean, you've all heard it, it's two roads. The buses in the afternoon, there's a lot of buses in the morning, there's a lot of buses in the afternoon. And Rose Garden is right there, there's a lot of traffic. So thank you for your time for listening to us. You're welcome. Anyone else? No? If I haven't closed you more. Step back up here. So are, are you? I'm sorry, excuse me. Name and address again, please, oh. just so we know who's talking. Okay. Faye Soul 10792, Texas Valley. All right, thank you. Time. Go ahead. Are you the one that's representing Rump and Marshall? So are you going to tell us what they're presenting or what they're wanting to do exactly? Can he do that? Well, it's kind of after the fact, but do I have the discretion to back up and let him? Sure, I can, right? Yeah. Yeah. You certainly do, and it, it, if you want to ask staff a couple of questions, we can touch on a few things. Okay. All right. Right. All right, thank you, Ms. Sowell. Anybody else? <coughs> Going once? Twice? All right. Well, let me insert, come on up, but let me insert a couple of comments here first. Uh, and as Mr. James pointed out, all we're doing this evening, uh, again, we're not going to do anything this evening, uh, it'll, we'll, it'll happen later, is to amend the comprehensive land use plan. Um, they still then have to request annexation and then they have to come in for the particular zoning they're looking for. Um, but if you'd like, if you give us some idea of what they intend to do out there. Generally, it, it's a. I'm sorry, excuse me. Oh, Paul Lando with MTR Engineers. <laughs> Thank you. All right, sorry. sorry. I forgot. Uh, it's generally about 115 lots. Um, it's about 115 lots. It, um, 80 foot wide lots is, is the general feel. So it will be, if you go out to Rhine Valley, those lots are typically 45, 50 feet. So they're going to be much larger than that. So 80 by 120, it's about 9,600 square feet each lot, more or less. Approximately 100. So the next step, you know, obviously is we will be, uh, required to perform a traffic impact analysis so we can go back out, uh, analyze the intersection, uh, <laughs> will be required because Schaefer 
road is on the thoroughfare plan, we will have to widen a certain portion of that in front of us. Okay, okay. I, folks, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be accommodating here, but you, you, you know, your president, you, I, I've asked you to speak, but this, you know, I, I've kind of got to cut off the back and forth here, okay? I, I, again, I, I don't mean to be that way, but we got to follow certain rules, and yeah. Anyway, the, 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 uh, there'll be a lot more to come. The, this, um, so, um, commissioners, do, do we want to discuss this tonight? I have a couple of general comments, but um, uh, whether you want to talk about it this evening, um, ask any questions, or wait until we're actually going to take action on it. I, I do have a question. Go ahead. Um, just for personal knowledge, because we haven't been in this situation yet. Sure. Uh, upon you said it hasn't been annexed yet the property has not been annexed so upon annexation they do the initial zoning within 30 90 days or it runs concurrently if you will so the annexation and zoning hit council the same night the process both processes are different but it'll hit council for annexation and right after zoning so we already know it's not zoned once it is annexed it's not currently zoned the zoning will have to be changed can't be changed unless we do the amendment no so let me sort of hit this. When the annexation goes through, council has to zone it. They, they legally, you got a zoning conformance with the comp plan, they've got to pass some city or turn to go, they're gonna be here till four in the morning because you got to put some kind of zoning on it when you annex it. Um, typically the way these things work, and I'm not speaking for the applicant, but, but just so folks understand is, Often what happens is developers put property under contract. They get an option contract on it and they say, look, I'm gonna put down some money, let you hold it. But before I buy it, before I close on it, I've gotta get my entitlements through the city. I wanna know that I can do what I'm planning to do with it. And if I can't get those approval, then I'm gonna walk away. You can keep whatever money I put down the option, but I go. And so often what'll happen with developers is if they can't get the comp plan amendment, then typically they would say, if I can't get the comp plan, I'm not gonna get zoning, what needs to be done in conformance, and at that point they'll walk from it and drop the, the contract. It doesn't always happen that way, but again, developers typically don't buy and close on a people property that they can't do what they want with or that the numbers don't work. Now that's not to say if the zoning allowed not, what, 115, but 100, they still wouldn't move forward, they very well might but generally that's the way the process works. So um, that's what would happen. And so that's where the comp plan amendment is telling, and you're right, Commissioner, the comp plan amendment is not zoning, but ironically, when you come back, if you come back for the zoning, if, the, if that goes forward, you'll hear us say, well, the comp plan shows this, and you need to zone in conformance with the comp plan. It kind of works both ways, which is why this is really important. All right, I, I had first a question. Um, the current timing on the 1518 expansion plan with TxDOT, do you know where we're at with that? It's probably gonna kick off in a year, year and a half or so, we think. That's so. required right of way easements. We're under the gun to get utility relocations yeah. done. 1518 is not going to kick off tomorrow. And unfortunately, as you guys probably know, it is not going to be done anytime soon. It is gonna be a painful number of years in shirts when we have 1103 under construction, 1518 under construction, and, and 35. Yeah, you guys know. So probably a couple of years before it even starts, and then the project itself is probably a couple of years. A few years. So maybe four to five years, maybe six. Well, what I'm trying to, I'm, I'm searching for some context in that uh, a lot of times, you know, we, we get these, uh, we get these requests in, um, but these homes don't appear magically overnight. It's uh, you know it's a phased-in project. You heard us tonight uh, up there with Homestead. We were talking about what unit six and unit eight, yep. and they're not even under construction. This is this, this is just the the, the plats for them. So um, while I wish we could wave a magic wand and fix 1518. Um, Hopefully, some of this stuff um, will, will possibly merge together. The, the other comment I wanted to make is, um, 
it, it, it's over the last few years, it's becoming, it's become increasingly frustrating, not just for us as commissioners, but for the planning department. Um, Shirts used to have a policy that if you built a subdivision that fronted a, a public right-of-way, you had to improve that public right-of-way. Um, the folks in Austin took that authority away from us, what, six, eight years ago? Yeah, generally with regards said to said, we can't do that anymore, okay? So, you know, you're looking at Ralph Burnett, you're looking at Shaver Road. Now we do, we are collecting roadway impact fees. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that'll allow the city um, to do some work out there. Um, I, I'll be honest with you personally, uh, I wish the city could be a lot more proactive when it came to roads, uh, but that means property taxes. Um, Money, yeah. You know, and it's so, so it's a, it's a, a give and take, but um, uh, anyway. So again, um, thank you for your input. Um, certainly, I'm, I'm sure staff was over there taking notes um, and unless the commissioners have anything else, okay. Just one question. Go ahead. Uh, um, just for myself and, uh, and the folks out there, under mixed-use neighborhood, what could be developed on that land? So, so it's generally residential, but, but again, it's the form and the density that changes. So on the mixed-use residential, what we've typically got as I look for my notes is single family residential, cottages, patio homes, townhomes, live work units, generally one to three acres density. What you would typically get on a single family, you may have some duplexes, you could have a few townhomes, but generally it's single family. And again, don't doubt that the applicant is saying we want to do single family detached homes and that's all we're going to do. So that's what you could get. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, some of us believe that single family could be done under neighborhood service. It's just, you know, it's all interpretation. Yes. And, um, oh, I, I did want to uh, also comment that, um, uh, well, well, we'll let that one go. Okay, if there's no nothing further on 5A, are we ready to go back to 4? We can just, you want to hit that at the end? Or we just keep going? Okay, all right, so we'll move on to uh, 5B. And so again, for the folks who were just here, you'll get another notice. Send in your comment again. We need the comment on the new, and you're welcome to stay. Resend it in. Yep, that works. Okay. All right, ZC 2021-016, hold a public hearing, consider and make a recommendation on a request to amend the comprehensive land use plan by changing approximately 363 acres of the future land use map from agricultural conservation and estate neighborhood land use designation to single family residential land use generally located 6,050 feet east of the intersection of Trinity Hill Road and FM 1518 also known as Bear County Property Identification Numbers 310053, 310060, 310061, and 310121, City of Shirts, Bear County, Texas. Who's up? Okay. Okay. So for the folks here for this item, a lot of it is fairly similar in terms of the background information. Again, what we've got before us is, the applicant is proposing to amend the comprehensive plan because ultimately the zoning they want to get is not in conformance with the comp plan. A distinction I will say here, I characterized the last one is the current designation was probably more dense and going a little bit less dense from that neighborhood mixed use to, to single family residential. The, the opposite is, is occurring here. The agricultural conservation typically references um, five acre minimum lot size, the estate's about a half acre minimum lot size, and in this they wanna come in and they wanna do typical single family residential development. As we talked about with the subcommittee report, we're kinda averaging 7,600 uh, square foot average lot size. So a much denser development. Again, I would characterize it though the form may be different, similar to what you might get with Rhine Valley or Willow Grove or, or, or <coughs> the new Saddlebrook development that's that's going forward. 
um, with it. And, and so again, the, the land use designation is, is the first step in the process. Um, again, you can see the property ownership, the public hearing notice on, on the graphic. And then coming in, we've given a feel for the property with regard to uh, the city zoning map. So again, not in the city limits, under a development agreement, so the process would be the same. Comp plan amendment, likely if they got that request, they would then move forward to annexation and zoning. If they didn't get the comp plan amendment, they, they may very well, well drop it, but that's their decision. Uh, I will say this too with regard to a little bit, and this often frustrates people, but keep in mind this, that under those development agreements, if the, if the property owner proposes to come in and annex and the city chooses not to annex, that doesn't mean development stops. It essentially means the city said, yep, we don't have to annex you, we've chosen not to, and there you go. Again, keep in mind, that would allow the property owner to develop, still, they just would not have zoning that they would have to comply with, so you would typically get an even denser residential development, they would not have to meet the city's um, requirements, and so one of the benefits of the city annexing the property ultimately is they have to comply with all of our regulations and codes than they might not otherwise. But again, this gives folks a feel for where the property is. Um, again, just as we look at the current comp plan exhibit to give a, a feel for, for what's what, um, we have the estate neighborhood and then the green is the agricultural conservation district. So the bulk of the property is the agricultural conservation district, a bit of is the estate neighborhood and if you remember from the comp plan, generally kind of this way over we've got a state neighborhood and then this way over we have the agricultural conservation going forward. Again, not that folks can necessarily read it here, but with the packet we have the request um, from the applicant going forward to amend uh, the future land use designation. They also uh, make note that they likely will come in with zoning through a planned development district, which is the pattern that we, that we typically use going forward. And, and so again, um, to remind folks, the comp plan in this area was last updated in 2013. That's when the amendment came forward. Um, the city is hopefully about to kick off a new comp plan update, as the commissioners know. Uh, we wanted to settle this issue of where we did, where it was appropriate to do single family residential development, what that mix of lot sizes need to be. We felt like it was important to get alignment on that before we start the process. Um, so I would typically expect the public part of that process to kick off likely given where we are now uh, in March or April or so. We have to put in an RFQ, we have to do a review of those, hire the consultant, get them on board, kick, kick it off with background. Um, but, but to be clear, the, the difference that they're, they're going for is this amendment to rural agricultural and estate to single family, which is a much denser development. Staff is recommending approval that, and in part we're recommending approval of it because of some of the decisions that we've recently made with regard to amendments to the comp plan and what we see as typical areas that might define or um, where we would do land use designation. So I'm gonna go back up a little bit and I'll use this graphic. As, as the commission knows, we had a fairly substantial um, zoning case come in um, for the Saddlebrook development. Fairly substantial, moved again from I think the, the, what the plan was to the single family residential. At the time, we had a lot of conversations that we felt like that's a significant change. That's not just a minor change, but that really we felt adjust the vision for this area. Um, and there was discussion and ultimately that amendment was approved by city council and ultimately then the zoning was approved by city council for that single family residential form. We have the, the Carmel Ranch development that subsequently came in thereafter. I think they've got items on the agenda as well to start their development process. And so you can see that what, and then we had the case tonight that was tabled and then the property down here. 
So while certainly it would not be unreasonable for the commission to say, you know, we've, we've started to make this change in this area here, but we really want to pause it at some point and not continue moving further south. I think from a staff perspective, when we look at it, when we started making this change up here and look at the reasons we made those changes, we feel like many of those same reasons are valid down in this area. And I'll touch on those in a minute, but I do want to sort of caution that doesn't extend north of Schaefer Road, in large part because y'all already platted out, you're already developed, it's generally built, they're vacantly and in there, but that development pattern is set and those lots tend to be bigger, as folks reference, they're on septic system, things like that. And again, with the issues that folks know who've lived here a long time with flooding in Crescent Bend and the CCMA plant, um, we don't see that continuing further north. The plan that we have from 2013 also does talk significantly about the area along the, the Cibolo Creek and, and the unique characteristics because it's on the Cibolo Creek, because of some of the typical development patterns there and things like that. So I wanna be really clear. I'm not saying that that won't, as part of this upcoming comp plan effort, change to something other. It's just not obvious to staff that that change would occur, may very well stay the way it is, or it may change to something different going forward. But I think from a staff perspective, we certainly see with this middle section, as we kind of come down in here, that there's some similarities in terms of topography, in terms of relationship to thoroughfare plans, and that essentially the reasons that we're seeing development pressure up in this area are the same that we hear, we see down here. And as those who've been around and been involved on the commission a while, remember that what we heard from folks back in 2013, in large part, was before the schools had come in, and not quite entirely with Corbett being there, but before we'd had the development, folks wanted to keep it rural. Many have lived there a long time, whether it be 30 years or multiple generations, and they wanted to maintain that rural character. And I will say though, it's not uncommon that over time, some property owners start to change. The reality is folks may have, have made their living off agriculture with the property. As people get older and pass on, and their, their children who didn't want to do that come in, it's not something they want to farm. Maybe the economies of the agricultural can't support folks the way they used to. But, but we hear it a lot with folks saying, you know, my, my folks live there, I grew up there, my folks passed away, we now live in Austin, San Antonio, whatever, it's not something I wanna farm, I'm not having anybody knock down my door going I wanna farm the land or, or raise cattle on it, but we have developers knocking on the door and they're willing to pay a lot of money for the land. And so often what you find over time is that view sort of shifts. It also starts to shift because, you know, folks don't live in, in a vacuum. What happens is we do have development starting to occur in the area. <coughs> we have other impacts from development. So all of the traffic that folks see on 1518 and, and the roads out there aren't just from shirts and development in the area. As you know, on the other side of I-10, outside of city of shirts, whether it's Universal City or Randolph Air Force Base or Cibolo, that traffic and that development starts to impact and encroach as well. And we start to hear some people say, even as they're still there, it's, it's not what it once was. It's not the rural environment that, that I enjoyed. I don't like the fact that it's developing. They've seen people move on and things like that. And so it's not uncommon to see that at one point when you, when you went out for public involvement, there was a strong preference, nearly unanimous, to maintain that rural character. But as we see, frankly, with the request, because the property owners have signed off on the request, that starts to change and it, it starts to come in for those various reasons. Now again, to be clear, that doesn't mean the commission has to recommend that change go forward. Maybe the change requested isn't the appropriate change, maybe it's not the appropriate time. One of the things we talk a lot about is what's the appropriate process to make that change. It could be the commission's not comfortable making the change just on this property, but says, I'd rather wait and take a bigger picture look. You may say, I hear you, Brian, but you know, I'm not sure that the area you've sort of described as, as we're seeing this change pattern, that this is really appropriate or that all the factors are the same going forward and that's part of what this, this process is. Um, 
going forward. But I think what we have seen since then being part of that last update is a lot of the folks that I recall showing up and say, we want this to maintain rural, are now showing up and saying, we want to see it change. Not everyone, and, and I want a couple things. You certainly have folks live out there on smaller lot or bigger lots saying, we don't want it to become that dense. You've got folks that spoke earlier saying, I want it to maintain this rural character. That's the struggle on this. I think where it's exacerbated that we face more of a challenge is because we are growing so fast. And it's not just in City of Shirts that grew from roughly 30,000 people in 2010 to over 40,000 people in 2020, but it's the entire area. You know, this is one of the fastest growing regions of the state. I think Comal County was maybe the fastest growing, or second fastest growing county in the country that had a population of over 100,000 to start with. That exacerbates it. We're seeing this occur much more rapidly. We're seeing occur over a five-year window when in a more typical growth pattern, that may occur over a 20-year window. And, and, and so in some ways, it makes it more difficult. In some ways, it makes it easier to see. Um, but I think generally staff's belief is that we've started to see this change from that middle core section. And really, we would probably say 15, 18 over not all the way to the Cibolo Creek, but kind of where the boundary of Saddlebrook kind of comes in. And as far as property boundaries, has already been set in motion to go single family residential. Part of that, I think, because of the discussions we have with regard to the other side of 1518 and the concern the opposite way due to conflicts with Randolph Air Force Base and changes in growth there, that likely we're seeing pressure to go a lower density on the comp plan, and this in some ways we think makes a little more sense. Um, lastly, to touch on a few things, and I'll try to wrap up to get to the citizens who, who we really wanna hear from. I think the comments about we don't keep up with infrastructure, that's certainly accurate. Commissioner Outlaw talked about it. Um, funding is obviously a challenge. Until development occurs, you don't need the infrastructure, but then often we don't have the funds to keep up. We're limited in terms of what we can make developers do um, based on state law going forward. And so in fast growth cities, that infrastructure lacks. And we've seen that. You've seen portables pop up at schools, portables add in another school, they build a school, and so you see a few portables go away, and then a few years later, those portables come, come right back. Traffic gets much worse before it gets better. It, it sort of almost takes it getting much worse for it to become a priority for that limited funding going forward. And then again, I certainly think there are, there are fair comments that when development occurs, despite the city's regulations for detention and drainage and things like that, the, the, it affects the drainage with detention. You know, we try not to flood people out, but certainly, yeah, not uncommon that we hear. Again, a lot of folks would say, you know, the, the, that's just the changing nature of climate that's occurred over time as well, regardless of whether you think how much people affected that, that, that certainly occurs too. So, um, but ultimately because of those zoning cases and those comp plan amendments that have come forward, staff sees a consistent pattern here and we're recommending approval of it. All right, thank you, Mr. James. Any presentation from the applicant? Not required, but you're more than welcome. And if you would please give us your uh, your name and address for the record. Hello, good evening. All right. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Marcus Moreno. I'm with Scott Felder Homes. Uh, address is 16103 of Via Chavano, San Antonio, Texas, 78249. Um, so, um, gather my stuff here. So we started working on this project uh, back in June of this year, um, kind of um, looking at the, there was a couple pieces of, of the property that had come on the market. Uh, they had some challenges, access, um, and we also kind of in doing our due diligence, started kind of meeting with staff and talking to them about the area and and uh, what they saw as kind of the desired use in this area. Um, and, uh, you know, we talked about zoning and the process, uh, and then we kept meeting with the landowners, talking to them. 
Uh, it's four different uh, landowners, uh, Wiederstein families here, uh, the Hartman family is also here, uh, a couple of the other families are not here. Uh, but we ended up assembling about uh, 363 acres uh, that were planning uh, a master plan community uh, similar to the Crossvine. Uh, different aspects, but the Crossvine is a very nice master plan. Uh, we are currently building in that master plan. Uh, we have been for going on probably four or five years now. Uh, it's been a great community, uh, and in a lot of ways this is kind of uh, you know, as that community starts finishing up over the next five years, this is kind of an area for us to grow into. Yeah, you know, these projects take a very long time. Uh, you know, there will probably be a rooftop uh, out there on this new project uh, for probably a couple of years uh, from now. Um, and so I'm assuming you can see this presentation on your screen. I'm just gonna kind of go through it real quick. Uh, so Scott Felder Homes, just to kind of equip, uh, we're a home builder, private home builder in San Antonio and Austin. Uh, we build about 500 homes a year. Uh, we're kind of a middle of the market, move up home builder, our average price point is uh, pushing about 500,000 now. Um, we uh, uh, are private, uh, we have been private for a very long time um, and we uh, pride ourselves on trying to build, you know, quality homes for homeowners. Uh, focus on customer service. Um, we've won Builder of the Year, uh, I think, about 15 or 18 times now. Uh, last uh, year, which or, I'm sorry, this year, which is 2021, uh, we won Builder of the Year for Greater San Antonio, Greater Austin Builders Association, uh, and then also the state of Texas. Um, we have over 20 communities in Austin and San Antonio, uh, just spread out all over from Bernie to Shirts to uh, all the way up to Liberty Hill, I, I think is our furthest community. Uh, and, um, you know, we're a great company. Uh, and, you know, kind of as Brian said, the Metroplex is growing. You know, we're all seeing a boom right now like we've never seen before. Uh, I think San Antonio metro area, we did 20,000 new home starts. Uh, or that's what we're pacing on to do this year. We've never done 20,000 home starts in, in the metro area. Uh, I think the record in uh, 2006 was around 16,000. So just to give you an idea of how much growth is going on and uh, Austin is way exceeds that. And um, you know, we're trying to find places, you know, people just keep moving in. Uh, to the Metroplex and, you know, we're trying to find places where we can build, you know, quality projects and, uh, you know, Shirts is one of them. I mean, we wanna stay in, in the city and keep building homes and, uh, and as I kind of go through this, I'll kind of tell you why this property uh, is an ideal place to do a master plan. So, uh, like I said, the property is about 363 acres, uh, you know, the. This is the concept plan that we've put together uh, and you know we've met with staff, we've kind of gone through, they've provided some comments. It's not done yet, uh, but I wanted to give you an idea of, of what the project uh, could look like. Uh, I don't know if I can point to anything, but uh, you know, oh, okay. Yeah, so uh, 1518, just to orient people, is uh, about here. And then this is Trainer Hill that comes back around. And then this is Weir Road that comes along here. Uh, so like I said, there's four different landowners. Hartman family is over here. Wiederstein are in the back. Uh, and then the Bright, uh Cap families are here. There's two different landowners, but I won't go too much into the details. It's, it's in the packets. But the, the issue kind of was with the property was access. You know, uh, we had to kind of put everyone together. Uh, you know, when you do these projects, you have to start thinking about, okay, how are we gonna circulate everyone in the community from a fire perspective? Uh, and that's why all the properties kind of had to be put together for it to really work. Um, you know, one of the big drivers uh, that I'll get into a little bit 
later is uh, utilities have really kind of grown in this area that's opening it up. Uh, so our goal is to create a master plan that's walkable, uh, uh, access to uh, city trail systems that'll be built down, down uh, Woman Hollering Creek. Uh, diverse lot size is, is important. Um, housing options and prices, you know, we're getting to a point uh, in the Metroplex, I mean, most, most houses have gone up $100,000 in the last year or so, and we're getting to a point where we're starting to price a lot of people out of the market. And if we can't figure out ways to replace, you know, these master plans, you, you know, we're basically gonna end up building more apartments. That's just the reality. Because uh, people will continue to come. You won't stop population growth. Uh, it's just there, it's a fact. Uh, and so, you know, we have to have places to put people. And, you know, the goal in this project is to still be able to get some housing, you know, maybe in the threes, uh, you know, before, you know, on certain lot sizes, you were talking in the twos, it's almost impossible to get housing in the 200,000s anymore. Um, home sites that are proposed, you know, this is 363 acres. Uh, this plan shows around 990 homes. That's below three units to the acre. Um, you know, we'll have comprehensive design guidelines uh, for architectural. Um, there's gonna be amenities in the community. Uh, it's gonna be walkable. Uh, and a lot of this stuff, you know, we'll work through with staff, you know, as Brian said, this is, this is kind of the start to give you guys an idea of what the community is gonna look like. Uh, we still are gonna go through a PDD process, zoning, annexation, uh, but I think we're headed in the right direction. Uh, just some renderings, I mean, you know, it's gonna be a typical master plan, it'll have uh, amenities, pools, uh, playgrounds, uh, access to the trail system. Um, you know, we're probably gonna do some, some community parks as well. Uh, these are some Scott Felder homes that we've done. Um, you know, this, this is a 40 foot product here, just to give you an idea of some of the elevations, different architectures. Um, you know, this is a, this is our model home out at the Arbors, uh, which is a larger lot community. Those lots are 80s and 90 foot lots. There will be some of that within this community. Uh, this is our model over in Viramindi. Um, that model is uh, a 50 foot model. It's on a 60 foot lot. Um, and then lastly, uh, this is actually kind of a cool product that we build uh, that's kind of more of an empty nester. Uh, zero lot line, it can fit on a, uh, a 55 foot lot. Uh, and it's kind of, you kind of enter the house through the side, which kind of opens it up. Uh, it's really cool, high ceilings. Um, and it's geared more for, you know, young families and then empty nesters, kind of a lock and leave concept. Um, so, I mean, the goal in the community, uh, I'll flip back, I mean, we've got, you know, we've got some ideas to do, uh, you know, in a couple pods like here, uh, these are alley loaded. Uh, we've got some other pods over here that are also be alley loaded. Uh, so bring in some diverse products, different elevations as you kind of drive through it. Uh, and you know, this is kind of, you know, the whole idea of, of the master plan is you have people within one community, you know, all the houses are not, you know, starting at 600,000. Um, you know, the, you can only really sell so much of that uh, and, you know, those communities are easy to do, but, you know, not everyone can afford that, that price point. Uh, some of the improvements that are gonna be done, um, I kinda hit on this real quick, but um, what's kind of opened up this, this uh, market is uh, utilities. Um, you know, there's the uh, Woman Hollering Creek wastewater line is uh, about to go under construction. It's, uh, and I, I'm just going off what was on the website, so uh, it's supposed to be complete sometime at the end of next year, uh, which would be 2022 or into 2023. Uh, you know, that's a $12 million project uh, that's gonna be going uh, over to the new CCMA plant. Uh, to give you an idea, this property, you know, basically that line runs right through the project and it goes, you know, here's the entire property here. Uh, our goal is to get everything to gravity back to that line, uh, which is 
really why we feel like you know that this land has, has kind of reached a point where uh, you know the city's invested money uh, into that to leave it as agricultural uh, you know it doesn't justify for the landowners who you know have been holding on to this property for a while for these type of improvements to get built uh, now it's kind of the time where they're trying to capitalize on it and it makes sense to change it now to single family um, you know some of the things that Brian hit on uh, as well is, uh, you know, the comp plan is not really zoning. Uh, you know, the, the, most of the property is actually in the ETJ. It's not in the city limits. Uh, a portion of it's under a development agreement, uh, which leaves it as agriculture. But our goal is to come in and work with staff and say, okay, let's create, you know, a nice community uh, and, you know, where we have diverse housing and not just, you know, where we go in and do, you know, just 70s and 80 foot lots and the whole project and it's just very expensive. Um, there's also, uh, the, there's also uh, water lines at the corner here that we'll be extending over uh, to this portion of the property. We'll be extending also looping over a 12 inch water line into the Hartman piece of the property uh, through Green Valley. Uh, you know, like I said, there's been elevated storage tanks built by both water companies. Uh, there's been a lot of money invested in this area for this growth. Um, some of the other things uh, that, you know, projects like this pay is we pay, you know, water, sewer, and road impact fees uh, that are pretty substantial to pay for a lot of the improvements that the city has made uh, and, you know, that allow these roads to be improved. Uh, you know, those impact fees are, are, you know, reports that are done, you know, by your staff that, and that say, okay, if we're going to put another house, guess what? They need to help pay for the infrastructure, and they come up and they calculate what that is. And so, you know, that's where, you know, they've invested this money, and if there's not quality projects that come in, you know, everyone else has to pick up all of those investments. Um, construction of collector roads uh, that go through the project, I mean, those are just required. You know, there's a thoroughfare that runs through the project. You know, we'll have to build that thoroughfare that'll, frankly, at some point, provide some relief to 1518, even when it gets expanded. Uh, you know, right now, a lot of this is rural, so everybody's kind of just piling out to 1518. Um, let's see, dedication of property for city and trail systems. Uh, you know, that's kind of a requirement as well. Uh, so there, there'll be a lot of improvements that'll be done with the project uh, that'll help with some of that traffic flow. You know, we're working with staff on, on you know, the details of those and the timing. Um, so in, just in summarizing, uh, you know, we're here requesting a comp plan amendment, which is the first phase. We're going from agricultural conservation and estate neighborhood to single family. Uh, you know, the purposes of the land use change allows for execution of the master plan. Um, you know, one of the reasons, like I, I said, is, you know, this property now has access to utilities uh, that the city's invested in. Uh, it helps with the growth of the metro. Uh, you, know, you know, if we can get homeowners, uh, single family homeowner, home, homeowners, that helps build equity. Uh, for those families, gets them out of apartments, into the city of shirts, increases the tax base uh, through sales tax, growth in, in uh, businesses. Uh, you know, realtors survive off of all this. And, uh, and again, this provides for uh, diverse housing options and affordability. Um, and so step two, if we move through this today, would be you know, we're going to apply for annexation uh, uh, and zoning, uh, and we'd be working with staff over the next couple months on finalizing the PDD deal details. So that's it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the input. Hey, once again, this is a public hearing. So again, I will open the meeting for public input. Anyone wishing to address the commission on this topic is uh, welcome to step up to the microphone. Anyone?
Name and address for the record, if you would, sir. Okay. Charlie Lentzman, 8447 Trainer Hill Road. Uh, I was born and raised off Trainer Hill Road. Um, I was fortunate enough to buy some property across the road where I was born and raised. It's rural, it's agricultural, and we'd like to keep it that way, so I oppose uh, the rezoning. But um, as a lady stated earlier, when we were approached about 10 years ago about annexation, we were told we were going to keep that area rural because that's what it is. It's all family farms, been in there for, my parents have lived there since 1950. Uh, my property adjoins Mr. Pinchhorn. He's been there for a couple of generations. So we'd like to keep it that way if at all possible. I know growth, like the gentleman said, it's this area, Comal County, Bear County. It's crazy, but I would suggest or request to give consideration if there's zoning does go through that there's some subdivisions along 15, 18 that have larger lots. I wouldn't be opposed to the one acre custom homes. Uh, the dense population they're talking about, I'm opposed to that 100%. Uh, so I'd just like for you to give consideration to the people that we've been there, that we've been rural. Sometimes we had a walk a mile to see our neighbor. They're getting closer by the day, but we'd like to keep it rural if at all possible. We do change. Consider larger lots for custom homes, not dense housing. As we were told 10 years ago, keep it rural. I think that would be as close to rural as you could do. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Anyone else? Hello, I'm Diane Hunter. I am with the Wiederstein family. Um, I am in favor of it, of the zoning. My parents lived on that property. My grandparents lived on it before them. But as we as children have grown up, we don't live there anymore. And we don't intend to farm it. So we have no use for the property. Um, so it is in our best interest if we sell it. And so I just want to let y'all know we're in favor of selling zoning the property. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm Becky Robertson. I live at 9275 Weir Road, Cibolo, and I live on the Wiederstein estate, and I am in favor of the zoning. All right. Thank you. Evening. My name is Jim Barr and my wife Sharon and I are here tonight to, uh, we, we live on 8758 Trainer Hill Road. I talked to Megan earlier, I think last week, and um, we're concerned about, I understand there's progress going to be involved, that's, that's inevitable, but we're right in the middle of all this. We're on Trainer Hill Road and we got 10 acres right in the middle, and they're surrounded us, so, I mean, on, all the way around us. So. I mean, they haven't, been, they haven't approached us on us selling, and no one's approached us, which is fine with us, because like Charlie Linsman said, we really don't want to sell anyway. Uh, it's just a shame that we're going to be engulfed. We're, we're both, my wife and I are both in our late 60s. We want to retire there. But it's going to be sad to see all, this, all these houses around us. I mean, that's, well, we bought this place in 76. We didn't think this would ever happen. So it's really kind of unfortunate. But I am opposed to this. So thank you for your time. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. Was there anyone else? Come on up. My name is Valerie Hartman, and it's nice to be up here talking to y'all. Um, my grandparents' place was the girth place. It's actually now in Hartman and Boynton Farm. And um, 
in reality, this isn't something we, my brother and I really didn't wanna do, but we did see a time where we couldn't farm it anymore. Um, we did have a man farming it, but we could see where it was getting harder for this gentleman to farm it because it, of all the cars that are driving back and forth, it's hard for him to even get to the farm anymore. And so we saw an opportunity that it's, it's time to sell. And um, so we're for it, we're for, for it to sell. Our, my mother's looking down saying, yes, it, it's time. She sold my uncle's farm down the road, which is a part of this being sold again. And um, I know she would say yes. Thank you. You're welcome, and thank you. Anyone else? Going once? Twice? All right, we'll close the public input part. Yeah, I, I've lived in shirts. Um, 1989 moved our family here. I, I live up in Savannah Square up on the hill here and um, transferred into Randolph. And one of the one of the things, the reason we ended up in shirts was because of the small community. It reminded me of the small community. I grew up out in California. 10,000 people when we moved out there, about 10,000 people when we moved here to Schertz. Town I grew up in is a suburb of San Diego. It's now an incorporated city of 75 to 80,000 people. There are houses where I used to hunt rabbits. It's, um, and I've seen a lot of changes here. Uh, I spent 25 years in the fire department. I spent a lot of time out in your neighborhood. Well, not a lot of time, but so I remember what it looked like out there. And it was a long run for us from our station down by the uh, senior center. So uh, it's, um, I, I, you know, I hate to say it's inevitable. Uh, part of my concern, you know, we, we, we sort of took the gene, let the genie out of the bottle when we approved that first amendment um, several months ago for um, Saddlebrook, I think is the name of it. and. Um, I'm, I'm still not sure that this is the this is the right way to handle the, the comp plan. It was a consensus document. It was a community input uh, to, and to be changing it in bits and pieces like this. Um, although I would be really surprised if the new comp plan didn't basically show us what we're um, what we're seeing uh, growing out there. One, one of the things that bothers me about this particular one is the is the cutout, if you will. There's, uh, looks like uh, one, two, three, four lots and uh, five lots across there um, that are, you know, surrounded by the new subdivision. And, and looking at, at your master plan, uh, unlike what I've seen coming out of uh, Crossvine, um, if, if, these, if these, you know, what are we gonna put in this, in this hole? Um, because you've, you've made no provisions to, ex it doesn't look like there's any provisions to extend a potential street in there and make it part of, of your sub, do you have something? Go ahead. I can certainly appreciate that and I'll, I'll comment on the step out. So again, what the applicant showed was sort of an initial early stage schematic. As we go forward, what we're gonna do is look at those property ownerships think about those questions of what happens down the road, five years, 10 years, 20 years. And so, yeah, I wouldn't assume that we would not have stub outs, but you're right, when we get those small parcels that run back, um, th they can't necessarily each control their own destiny. So for example, this piece may not be able to come in and really develop because the stub out goes here, the stub out comes in here. That's some of the challenges you get with development. Even with the cross final I'll make reference. Last night at council, they picked up a piece that was about two acres, one of the little leave out pieces. It, it's just, we wish development were orderly. It, it's just not, it's messy. And uh, this, um, certainly the concept that, that the applicant presented 
um, is, is, is certainly, you know, in contrast to my least favorite new subdivision, um, at least shows some innovation and diversity. Um, anyway, I'm commissioners. Go ahead. Mr. Chairman, I don't have a, a question. I understand what, what's before us. I do have a comment, though. So for me, I haven't lived here as long. Um, back in the late 90s, I was stationed here at Randolph. My daughter was born here. And when it was time to retire, I came back and was stationed at Randolph one more time and figured it's time to stay in a community that from a long time ago that I've loved and that's coming back to shirts. So since 2012, we've been here and we live in a new neighborhood, granted, it's in Northern Shirts, but I've been around enough to know that generally Southern Shirts being rural is being, I wouldn't say encroached on, but expanded, being built up, uh, being developed left and right. Um, I do agree, I like the rural nature of Southern Shirts. Um, Central Shirts, Northern Shirts can change and develop just a, a, as, as it will. Um, but I do like that nature of the rural southern shirts. I struggle with these cases, though. I struggle with these cases because I'm pitting inevitable development um, and, and the pains that it does bring on our infrastructure, which will catch up in the years pa as years come along. But I struggle between the inconveniences and the changing of the nature of southern shirts with individual property owner rights. And here in Texas, it's very important. If you own land, you should have the right to do with that land as you see fit. It's a struggle between those two uh, polar opposites. I will say this too, that if memory serves me, that this body has recommended denial to city council on two different occasions for large developments in Southern Shirts. Um, they've recommended denial and City Council has gone against that recommendation and has approved these large developments. Got it? That might be the way things are changing. City Council does represent the people. We are just a body of people as well. And with that in mind and the inevitable develop development that's down there, I agree with people that are saying slow down a little bit too. Um, I think we should slow down a little bit and let some things catch up and let some things finish out. Let's see what the impacts are on all of this rapid growth that we see. Um, Mr. Chairman, that's really all I have to say. All right, thank you, sir. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. James, there you are. Oh, well. I need some procedural help here because we're down to a minimum quorum, okay? Um, and it takes, the, the, the way I read our bylaws, it takes four affirmative votes on any motion to approve it. And, and so what I'm wrestling with, kind of getting the, the, put the cart in front of the horse here because I don't know which way the, the motion is gonna go. Um, but the idea is to move this forward to city council. So if a motion were to fail, the options are what? Can we, we, then it, it can't go to council with the... No, it, 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 you, you've, got, you've got kind of a couple of options here. And, and so let me, let me talk about this because I think it's important to understand the implications of what your recommendation might be. Um, our ordinance doesn't dictate a higher standard in terms of a larger percentage of council has to approve this if there's, an, if there's, a, if there's not a positive recommendation out of the, the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, and, and so I don't mean to say it, it doesn't matter. Your, your recommendation certainly matters, whether it's, it's for or against. Um, but, but I th think what tends to matter the most on cases like this is the discussion that occurred, the comments we had, the, the things like that. 
Um, and, and so you have a couple of options and we don't know which way it'll go. So certainly if it's unanimous to recommend approval of it, it's clear it's approved. If it's unanimous to recommend denial of it, then that both those recommendations sort of carry. If you're split, it's neither approved, it's neither denied, a couple things could occur. You could try a different motion. I don't know what that would be in this case because inherently the property owner is saying, look, don't give me a recommendation for a different comp plan amendment that doesn't work for me. Just, I think they would say, give me an up or down and let's, let's kind of go. What the commission could do is you could table it. That's within your purview. You could table this to the next meeting and say, you know, we didn't reach consensus, but if you get consensus to table it, so if four of y'all agree, we'll, we'll just table it, and effectively wait till the next meeting, January 12th, when we hopefully have more commissioners there. If we have a full seven, then it takes four of the seven to approve it. So that's one option that you could go. Ultimately though, if you can't agree on an op, a, a motion that gets the four, either to table, approval, or denial, at some point it's considered a denial and goes forward with a, with a denial recommendation. You sort of hit that impasse that happens sometimes that we couldn't recommend approval inherently there was not a recommendation for approval, which effectively leads you to kind of a denial, as we've heard before on cases, and it would move forward that way. Um, I'm gonna look to the applicant real quick for a nod and maybe the applicant's attorney and to see how much the time is an issue that you'd want it to move along on the 12th, or if you say, you know, we've got some time, we could delay to come back in January and, and see what that recommendation is. I think we tend to show deference often to the applicants in these cases if they like it to get to council quicker, if they say, nope, we've got time, we've got big holiday plans and we'll just come back in January. Often that's not the case, but I, don't, I, I tend to show deference. Yeah. So I think the applicant would prefer to move it along even if that means you can't reach agreement and it moves forward with that denial. Uh, move it forward that way. So I, that would be my recommendation is that you not table it. Okay. In deference to it. Well, something for the commissioners to consider. Um, we heard at our last meeting, we heard the presentation from the uh, subcommittee that looked at zone, straight zoning and PDD. Uh, I heard that presentation again last night at city council, a lot of positive feedback uh, from both bodies. Uh, I think um, I keep going back and I hope I'm not going to get in trouble because I keep re referencing um, what is it story what, what um, Saddlebrook Saddlebrook okay uh, we, we were not impressed by the you know that that to me was a, a, a extremely dense um, the subcommittee, and I think with the positive reception of those recommendations by council last night, gives us a little more, gives us a lot more flexibility and guidance in terms of um, what actually gets built out here. Uh, and again, looking at their concept plan, it is radically different from the one that started all of this. and. Um, uh, you know, I hate to say let's send it forward with approval just because they've approved the previous two or three, uh, but but I think the environment um, and this in this particular project uh, is, is a little more palatable. Uh, again, I don't like the tail wagging the dog, but uh, I don't know if our I really don't think our, our, our brand new, you know, redoing the comp plan is gonna show us anything different. So, uh, commissioners with that, if, if no one else has anything to add, uh, this is a recommendation uh, to city council to either uh, we approve it or deny it. And if I may, sure, go ahead. person just add, add one comment, just as a reminder, as I mentioned earlier before the previous item, the comp plan designation is sort of a broad, high-level designation. So even within the single-family residential designation, they're asking for what may be appropriate for zoning on one property might not be the same thing that's appropriate on another property. So for instance, um, 
where you have these leave out kind of ag pieces, that may affect that land use plan and the lot size and density close to those as opposed to areas further over. So again, I will say that, that we try to be real clear with applicants as they move forward that generally the concept is agreeable here. When it goes through zoning, what we don't want to do is get to annexation and then grant a zoning that they can't live with, so we work through it. But I simply say that, that zoning is not a one size fits all, clearly with the PDD that the applicant referenced, and so you have ability. But generally it's within that single family format, but you can, you can work the PDD around some of those considerations if that helps. Yes, sir. So would uh, someone look here to make a motion? I can't, unfortunately. The bylaws don't allow me, so. I'd like to make one statement just real quick, though, too. Just uh, agreeing with the chairman as far as the comprehensive land use plan. It's out there. Yes, it's a little old, but it was a consensus document with uh, public input. And until we get another one, I don't feel comfortable with it. So I'm going to make a motion, Mr. Chair, that we recommend to City Council to deny CZ 2021-016. Second. All right, I have a motion to recommend denial from Commissioner Odom and a second from Commissioner Platt. Um, and I've said it in the past and, and Mr. James made comment, I'm, I'm sure um, the members of the City Council will watch the video of tonight's meeting and, and understand where we're coming from in, in our comments. So um, if there's nothing else, call for a vote. Aye. 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 All right, thank you, sir. So again, it goes forward to City Council, check the website with the date going forward and another public hearing. All right, at this time, I, 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 I'm, I'm, we're going to backtrack. I think Mr. Price has been sitting out there long enough. You, you, and we'll, we'll go back to, to item 4D, PC 2018-003-EXT. Um, so Platt has. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I guess I, we can maybe wait for. We'll just pause for a few minutes. So, you know, let 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 these people make their way out, and um, for Commissioner Platt to come back. Mm -hmm. um, is technically since the meeting still happened? The, since, since the meeting is still in, in session, did, did, you have, did you have a question? I, Wake up over there. <laughs> Wake up. All right, yeah, go, go, go ahead, Emily. Okay, so I have copies of everything to try to help with this. So this is Ordinance 17 S01 that was brought up. So this ordinance actually rezoned 375 acres. Part of that that was mentioned was this track two, which is 41.14 acres, okay? So if we go further into the ordinance to the exhibits, I'm gonna show you a couple. So this is the, let's see if it'll focus here, maybe. This is the survey of that track two, the 41 acres, okay? So keep this image in mind. Then we're going to go to the full cross mine picture. 
We're going to zoom in a little bit. This is that same 41 acres, which the 15 acres that's on for tonight um, for approval or denial, the 15 acres is part of that 41 acres, which was done under the 17S01 zoning. So I did pull the preliminary plot approval. The preliminary plot also had a six month extension, that approval and the original final plot and all of them have the same legal description referenced exactly the same as tonight um, on the agenda um, and all of that. Did that help answer the question or can I show you something else? The same as the approval for extensions, but they still don't match the exhibit in the original ordinance. So the 15 acres is out of that 41 acres that your reference is track two, that's reference right. is track two in here. The 15 is out of that 41. That exact picture in the exhibit in the one from tonight is the exact same one from the ordinance, <laughs> mirror image with a different description on it. That's, that's my concern. So if you go further into that paperwork and it actually shows the lots and the lines, the description on that one is different than the one that we have tonight and it's the exact same picture. So not this one, not that exhibit, which that one, mm -hmm. that, that one, this one. So it's conceptual. So when you look at that exhibit and then you go to the page I referenced, which I think is page four, which discusses this exhibit right here mm -hmm. uh, as section two, that legal description is different than what's on the same exact picture that's in tonight's packet. So this 15 acres is part of the track two that you're referencing? Right. This, okay, so if we look at, do you have, I'm just gonna show, this is from the preliminary plot. So if you look at, this is the 15 acres, right? Right. That fits in right here into the 41 acres. So this survey is for that whole piece that was part of the 375 acre zoning. And this is just a portion of that 41. So I can tell you the survey that's depicted in here as track two, all of this information is the same as what's on the plots that were previously approved and the one on tonight. It's just the acreage changes because it's not the whole 41 acres that was part of the zoning. It's only the 15, which is the garden home. The 41 includes the garden home, the multifamily apartment complex portion, all of that. Okay. If you say it's the same, then it's the same. Anyone, anyone else? All right, so we're looking for a motion to either approve or deny PC 2018-003-EXT. I make a motion that we approve PC 2018-003-EXT. A motion to approve from Commissioner Ray. Do I have a second? A second. And a second from Commissioner Odom. Do we have any further discussion, questions? Commissioner Platt, if you're not satisfied, don't, you don't have to give up. But, you know, I'll, I'll be. It's the same. Well, yeah. All right. I will rely on the word of the. Okay, well, then I'll call for the vote. Aye. 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 All right, so we have uh, four ayes and none opposed. That motion passes. All right, where are we? Item number six. Items for individual consideration. 6A, PC 2021-049, consider and act upon a request for approval of a preliminary plat of the Willow Grove Estates Commercial Subdivision an approximately 1.7 acre tract located at the southwest corner of Schaefer Road and FM 1518, City of Shirts, Bear County, Texas. Good evening, Commission. Um, so this is for PC 2021-049. Um, so it's 
just us um, now. Um, I know we have a couple more projects to go through, um, so I appreciate your patience. This is for the Willow Grove Estates Commercial Preliminary Plat, Megan Harrison Planner. Um, so to provide reference, the property here outlined in green, um, as topic of, as tonight, as we heard, Schaefer Road, um, this is reference, and then 1518. So the property is going through a preliminary plat for approximately 1.7 acres um, to establish a commercial lot. So the, with that, the property as identified is on FM 1518 as well as Schaefer Road, but also it does abut, and this last image will kind of be more clear, it does abut the Willow Grove subdivision. So with that, they do have another access point onto Brook Orchard. So with the access points, there will be one onto Brook Orchard and there will be one onto Schaefer Road. However, as we did here tonight, that there is the um, FM 1518 expansion going through. So they are doing a dedication of 10 feet. So with that, TxDOT did review um, this plat because it is along FM 1518 and they are going to be requiring a one foot non-access easement along FM 1518. So due to the location of this property, you know, they're at a pretty busy intersection as we've heard tonight of Schaefer Road and FM 1518 and then you already have Brook Orchard which is the entrance to the Willow Grove subdivision. There was not enough distance to allow another entrance onto this already busy roadway. Therefore, TxDOT having that um, being placed on the plat. So it is going to be serviced by the City of Shirts for water and sewer. Um, there has been a drainage report that's been reviewed by the City Engineering Department and it has been um, approved. So with that, the preliminary plat has been reviewed by all the departments, engineering, public works, fire, and planning with no objections. Therefore, staff is recommending approval of the Willow Grove Estates commercial preliminary plat. All right, thank you. What's the current zoning out there? G GB, right? Correct. Your business, okay. Commissioners, questions, discussion? Uh, just uh, a curiosity, do you know what they're gonna, or they're trying to plan to put in there? So at this time, no. Um, it's just, we've been approached for the plat. Um, there has been kind of discussions, but for a pre-development meeting, but for this case, for this plat in particular, we have not had any indication from the applicant of what their intentions are. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? All right, looking for a motion to either approve or deny PC 2021-049. Make a motion that we approve PC 2021-049. Second. That was uh, Commissioner Platt. All right, motion to approve from Commissioner Ray, a second from Commissioner Platt. Any further discussion? Call for the vote. Aye. 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 Four ayes, none opposed. Motion passes. 6B, PC 2021-045, consider and act upon a request for approval of a preliminary plat of the Carmel Ranch subdivision, an approximately 40-acre tract of land located approximately 4,000 feet east of the intersection of Lower Seguin Road and FM 1518, City of Shirts, Bear County. Hello again, Commission, PC 2021-045 for the Carmel Ranch Subdivision Preliminary Plat. Um, so as we saw um, in the earlier um, presentation, this is the uh, kind of a brief little snippet. This is the Carmel Ranch Subdivision here outlined in green, uh, Lower Seguin Road, Rhine Valley, and then the proposed Saddlebrook Subdivision. Um, so just to provide some reference, there was the PDD ordinance that the Planning and Zoning Commission did pass, um, and that was done in April 14, 2021, so just here pretty recently, and then uh, the City Council did approve it on May 11th. So with that, they came um, to the planning staff, planning staff to preliminary plat approximately um, 40 acres of land to establish 127 residential lots. Um, so with that, it's going to be comprised of two um, lot sizes, so one of those being, or excuse me, three lot sizes. So one of those being the 55 by 125, and then the other one being 60 by 120, and then the last one is 70 by 120. So it'll have a, it'll have a variation of lot sizes within the subdivision. Um, with this subdivision, as you are aware, is on Lower Seguin Road, um, so there will be some dedication of approximately um, 15 feet along the whole entire frontage of this property. 
Um, there will be two access points from the property of Carmel Ranch onto Lower Seguin, and then from Quail Crest um, onto Lower Seguin. It will be serviced um, through the City of Shirts Water and Sewer. Um, there has been a drainage report that has been um, reviewed by the City of Shirts Engineering Department um, and has been approved. So it is a couple of pages, um, but here is the first page kind of indicating um, the plat. And also with this plat, they, um, they are going to be doing some kind of open space, kind of trying to kind of mirror what we've seen in earlier plats of doing kind of that connectivity throughout the um, subdivision through some uh, kind of connections through like walk trails or anything like that. So with that, the preliminary plat has been uh, um, reviewed and with no objections by the fire, engineering, public works and planning, therefore staff recommends approval of the Carmel Ranch subdivision preliminary plat. Thank you, Megan. Did you have a, a picture of the, the whole thing was, was where? So this is, so the Carmel Ranch is this entirety. Um, so it is, it is just going to be done in one phase. Well, um, no, I was, what I was looking for was a single, in other words, instead of having this thing spread over three pages, they don't have one where it's. Oh, so if I oh, zoom okay. in, it's yeah, going to be extremely yeah. pixelated, but bear no, with me. No, what, what I'm looking for, that's what I thought I saw, thank you, is the one up in the right corner. Not that one, the other corner. Right there, that one, yeah. Thank you. Now, at the time the PED was approved, Dan, as I, as I mentioned to you the other day, mem mem memory gets, it's overwritten a lot. Um, but I think I see what I'm looking for. I was, I was looking for some extension into the adjacent properties to the west, and it looks to me like just, uh, well, that's, to me, that's the south. But if you go up that road, it looks like they had that, well, you just went by it. That intersection right there is a stub out, okay. So what I started to ask for, um, this is in conformance with the, the master plan. Um, so the master thoroughfare plan is a conception. No, no, not the thoroughfare plan. Okay, we when when they when they when they came in. Hang on, when when they came in to amend the comp plan, and then when they came in with the BDD, they showed us a concept master plan, right? You, and then they and then they work with staff to to develop the official master plan. Am I correct of the subdivision? Right. So of the roadways on on the plat. I guess well, maybe in other words, understand. how the streets are laid out, where the park's going to be, how many lots there are. Correct. Okay. So two parts. It is in conformance with the PDD and what was presented and is written in okay. the ordinance. So the master plan phase typically is only required if it's going to if the subdivision is going to be done in phases. Oh, okay. So if you think, gotcha. you know, Rhine Valley, it's in multiple units, so it had to go through that master development plan mm -hmm. MDP process. Okay. Since the full acreage is on this preliminary plot, they're not required to do that. Yeah, okay. okay. That, that's what I was fishing for. Thank you, Emily. So again, You might be my, this, this might be my number two least favorite subdivision, but <laughs> anyway. All right. So all we're, again, this is just, you know, we've, we've gone past the, the, this is just plat approval. So. And even though I don't like the whole layout, that's, we're past that, so. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I motion to approve PC 2021-045. I'll second that. All right, I have a, have a motion to approve from Commissioner Platt, a second from Commissioner Odom. Any other discussion or questions? Call the vote. Aye. 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 Four ayes, none opposed. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, where are we? 6C. 
PC 2021-046. Somebody stayed. I thought everybody bailed out on us. Okay. <laughs> PC 2021-046, consider and act upon a request for approval of a preliminary plat of the Greytown Road Subdivision Unit 1A in approximately 23 acre tract of land located approximately 550 feet southwest of the intersection of Greytown Road and Bainig Road, City of Shirts, Bear County. Good evening, Commission. So this is for PC 2021-046, Greytown Subdivision Unit 1A, Megan Harrison. Um, so just to provide reference, the property here outlined in um, green kind of has a unique shape. Um, and then Greytown Road, Bainig Road, and then as well, um, Scenic Lakes Drive. Um, so here is the preliminary plat. Um, so this one did go through a um, PDD um, zoning in, uh, so the city planning and zoning commission did hear it on September 9th, 2020 and made approval. Um, city council did have the final approval on October 27th, 2020. Um, so with the Greytown, this one did go through the MDP process due to the large amount of acres that it did have and that they were going to be doing some phasing. Um, so this one was in conformance with the um, MDP. Um, so we did look at that. We looked at the PDD as well as the UDC requirements as well. Um, so the preliminary plot is approximately 23 acres of land to establish 47 single family residential lots. Um, so with that, it's going to be comprised of two two lot sizes. So the first one being that 80 by uh, 130 and then the 100 by 130. So you'll have those two mixtures throughout the subdivision. Um, the first point of access will be from Albury Park, um, if I can get my mouse. So through here to Greytown Road and then um, I think Height Cross. Am I saying that correctly? Okay, Height Cross, um, which is down um, here to Bainig Road. So the property will be serviced by the City of Shirts for Water. Um, it will be serviced by Sarah for Sewer. Um, the um, engineering department has reviewed the drainage report um, and has approved that. And then um, with, with the Greytown Unit 1A, since it does touch Greytown Road as well as Bainig, there will be right-of-way dedication provided. Um, so the overall subdivision will be providing 2.27 acres of land for right-of-way dedication um, for this plat. So with that, the preliminary plat has been reviewed with the PDD, um, the UDC re U rules and regulations, and has also been reviewed by Fire Engineering Public Works and Planning with no objections. Um, therefore, staff recommends approval of the Greytown Subdivision Unit 1A preliminary plat. And then, like you all know, um, Brooke is here for any questions, okay? All right, thank you. So this is the one I asked you for the big picture. Were you, were you able to find me the big picture? There you go. So I don't know if commissioners remember this one, but this is this is basic. Oh, yeah. Yep. So here is the unit 1A, and then just for reference, as I know, we're going to hit on 3A. Here is unit 3A, and so here is Greytown, and then Bainig. Okay. Just for reference. No. See. Thank you. That that's very helpful. Commissioners, discussion, questions. What is this zoned? Is a state neighborhood? No, this one is the PDD. PDD? Yes, sir. I, I think this is a great example of a builder who's not greedy and trying to slam as many houses into a property as possible. Well, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with that area out there, that, that started with, um, oh, what is that? Halley, what? Halley Cove? Halley's Cove. And they, they started out there with the big lots and it's been uh, what are they? They're half acre lots, I think, because of septic uh, requirements. And, and they, they, they're expensive homes. I haven't looked at them lately, but, you know, back they were, they were up in the four fifty five hundred thousand dollars $500,000 range. They're, they're uh, pushing the, the limit on uh, fire sprinklers, like $3,500. they are big homes, nice homes, and they're selling like hotcakes out there. So, um, but apparently over on, only on that side of 1518, not on the other, yeah, so. All right, need a motion? Mr. Chairman, I have a motion to approve PZ, oh, oh, sorry, PC 2021-046. Second. 
I have a motion to approve from Commissioner Platt, a second from Commissioner Ray. Any further discussion? Call for the vote. Aye. 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 Four ayes, none opposed, the motion passes. Item D, PC 2021-047, consider and act upon a request for approval of a preliminary plat of the Greytown Subdivision Unit 3A, an approximately 29-acre tract of land located on Greytown Road, roughly 3,000 feet northwest of the intersection of Greytown Road and I-10, City of Shirts, Bear County. Your turn. Last one. PC 2021-047 for Greytown Unit 3A preliminary plat. Um, so as we kind of saw in the MDP exhibit, but um, here as well in outlined in green is the uh, Greytown Unit 3A, um, and then here is Greytown Road. So um, the preliminary plat is approximately 29 acres and will be comprised of a 65 single family residential lots. And just as unit 1A, it'll have the two lot sizes, so that 80 by 130 and that 100 by 130. So you'll see that kind of mixture throughout, um, throughout the subdivision. Um, the property will have um, the point of access from Lochkin Lane um, to uh, Greytown Road and then um, which turns into Netherford right here. And Netherford, you can't see it, but imagining um, when Unit 4, Unit 5, all these other units that are below Unit 3A come in, um, it will connect kind of down through here. Um, the other point of access um, will be through Shafflesbury onto um, Greytown Road right here. Um, so the property will be serviced by the City of Shirts um, for water um, and then uh, Sarah for sewer. Um, the engineering department did review the, drain, uh, the uh, drainage report um, and then with that um, they will be doing dedication just like with Unit 1A since they are touching Greytown um, Road there will be 0.755 acres of land for dedication with this plat. So like the other one it's a little couple pages. Um, so with that, the preliminary plot has been reviewed with the PDD um, and the Fire Engineering Planning and Public Works Departments reviewed it with no objections. Therefore, staff is recommending approval of Greytown Unit 3A. All right, thank you. Uh, I did want to ask, um, serviced by Sarah, does that mean the, um, uh, it, it's not like other parts where shirts is the collection system and sends it to CCMA, Sarah will have all the Okay, so the pipes in the ground will actually be serviced, it belong to shirts and... But Sarah will be doing the treatment. But we then send it to Sarah. Okay, got it. Anything else, commissioners? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion to approve PC 2021-047. Second. I have a motion to approve from Commissioner Odom, a second from Commissioner Ray. Any further discussion? Call for the vote. Aye. 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 Four ayes, none opposed, motion passes. Thank you. Item seven, requests and announcements. Request by commissioners to place items on a future planning and zoning agenda. Anything? Item B, announcements by commissioners. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to take a minute to tell the city staff, thank you. Thank you for all the hard work that you do on all of these cases. Thank you for bringing this to the commission in such a professional manner um, and I'd like to also say uh, happy holidays since we won't see anybody until after the new year happy new year as well and the same to the commissioners up here happy holidays and happy new year Thank I you. second that anyone else announcements by city staff I'm back so as the last meeting, um, there was a kind of a forgotten piece that the Slim Chickens that was part of the kind of overview that we provide in the packets for the information, this, um, I did not provide the image of this. So it is a 3,700 square foot um, chicken drive through restaurant. <laughs> If you will, um, I actually I can actually can say when I went up to Tyler, Texas, I did do a taste test, and I can tell Emily that the desserts that are in the mason jars are quite excellent. 
So when it does come, you will most likely see me and Emily, if not maybe Tiffany too, maybe Brian will go too, in the Slim Chickens restaurant, eating the desserts out of the mason jars. This one is the Verde Shirts Medical Office building. It is a 53,000 approximately square foot building. Um, so if you would think Verde Parkway, across the street is Amazon, just to provide some reference. So this one was also, um, that has come into the city for development as well. With that, I have nothing else. All right, thank you very much. Item number eight, information available in the Planning and Zoning Commission packets. Um, no discussions to occur. They have a list of our current current projects and where they stand with City Council. And that concludes our business. I will say uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and we'll see you all next year. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>